Uh, welcome to the Committee on Environment, Climate, and Legacy, and we'll call this committee in order. Um, let the record reflect that today is Friday, March 17th. <laughs> we had the time of yesterday. And it's 10-10, 10-10. Uh, well, good timing, yeah. So uh, we're going to have, on our agenda today, we're going to have um, rough, about 10 bills. Uh, half of them will be uh, agency, agency related bill. Uh, so we're going to keep our moderate pace and uh, keep it going uh, as uh, fun as we can possibly can, and also engaging as well. So first bill on the agenda here is Senate File 2803. Uh, Senator Kunish, uh, the Tibetan American Foundation of Minnesota. Uh, Senator Kunish, you may proceed. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. To, uh, this morning, I'd like to start us off with Senate File 2803. Um, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to introduce this bill for an act relating to arts and cultural heritage. Uh, it would be appropriating $50,000 to the Tibetan American Foundation of Minnesota, known as TAFM. Um, it represents the vibrant Tibetan community of Minnesota, which is home to over 5,000 members and growing. And I can tell you that um, in my district of Columbia Heights, I think I have one of the largest uh, communities of Tibetan neighbors in the nation. Um, and it's growing. Um, cultural organizations like TAFM are essential to preserving Minnesota's diverse and rich cultural heritage. They serve as a platform for cultural exchange, promoting mutual understanding and respect, respect among different communities. This funding will go a long way in helping TAFM continue to provide resources and programming. Of note, since its inception in 1992, this is the first time <coughs> excuse me, that TAFM is being considered for such a funding bill. Through this, we have an opportunity to show our commitment to com communities that make Minnesota the diverse and vibrant place that it is. Today, TAFM, re represented by their leader, um, and I will now welcome um, our first testifier, and um, you may state your full name and begin your testimony. Thank you. Please state my your name, name for is the record. Uh, welcome. Th thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Dr. Tsawang Nudup. Uh, I'm a physician by profession. I'm here uh, as a special advisor to the TAFM board and a former uh, TAFM president. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chair Senator Hall, the committee members. Thank you, Senator Kunish, for carrying our bill. Thank you to committee administrator uh, Kara Jefferson for holding, placing our bill on the uh, agenda today. You know, the last couple of days has been a extremely uh, educative experience for me. I was here waiting until 7 p.m., then went back, and this morning, for the first time in several decades, I got a warning from work saying that you miss, you can't change your schedule like this. But it's all for a good purpose. Uh, I'm here uh, in support of the Senate file 2803, uh, in support of TAFM appropriation bill for the fiscal year 2024 relating to arts and cultural heritage. Uh, I was supposed to be followed by the next speaker, Mrs. Ngawan Doker, who is the current president of TAFM. Uh, however, she also ran into the same issue and she will uh, not be able to join uh, today, unfortunately. So I'll try to cover uh, some of things that she was supposed to say. Uh, I can say that the impact of your support uh, will be far more consequential than the dollar amount. TAFM provides its children a route to their rich cultural heritage, help them grow as responsible Tibetan Americans, and flourish as contributing global citizens. As uh, rightly said by Senator Kunish, uh, by the way, uh, I just learned that Senator Kunish is the first native descent uh, elected as the uh, senator. Uh, congratulations, and this word native really resonates with me uh, because I was fortunate having a U.S. citizen after much effort uh, 
and several tries and almost getting kicked out of uh, Shanghai, I was able to visit my parents' home who had to leave Tibet in 1959 and I was able to see my ancestors' land and knowing that I and my ancestors were native to Tibet and that word really resonates uh, when I read Senator Cornish's uh, bio. Similarly, uh, Chair Senator Hao, I know you're of Hmong descent, uh, called Mio, uh, one of the China's 56 uh, ethnic groups, and Tibetans are now considered as one of those. So there is always a connection. Of course, everyone here, we are all Minnesotans. So culture has many aspects. Uh, no doubt, we all have our own culture, uh, we, different food, dress, uh, of course, uh, language. Uh, similarly, Tibetans do have the script Tibetan. This, what is special about the Tibetan uh, language is this, this ha, Tibetans have the largest repository of the Buddhist uh, philosophies and teachings. And Tibetans are the ones who hold Buddha's 2005 years uh, teaching and uh, the best practitioners uh, in the world currently. And the other most important thing that I would like to share is the Tibetan culture is based on mindfulness, nonviolence, and compassion. And all these uh, are dependent on the foundation of what we call as interdependence of everything, every living thing, including environment. And this concept, I believe, is something we really need in this day and age all over the world. Therefore, uh, I really appeal to you to provide your support to enact this bill. In the last 30 years of TAFM, we have never received any support or uh, appropriation bill as it was spoken. This is the first time. So in a way, you are creating history, uh, Chair Ho, uh, her and all the committee members, uh, Senator Kunish and everyone here, and we as Tibetans, uh, we, we will remain ever grateful. And of course, this will not be the first time. Uh, we will continue to do the work that we have been doing. We have been sharing uh, our culture, exhibiting it at different venues, including Timberwolves, uh, games, and uh, universities, uh, colleges, libraries, and Columbia Heights, everywhere. So we'll continue to do and do more. Uh, we do have programs after schools, uh, counseling called Lamtun. We do teach them uh, Tibetan language, uh, art, music. So it's a huge and a very extensive program. And to realize that the community uh, of merely 5,000 currently, and we started off with 160 in 1992. Since then, we have been doing it all on ourselves. Uh, it's quite remarkable. And therefore, I really appeal that this is the right time uh, to support us and show your appreciation and encouragement. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tsawang Angat Dap, for uh, giving us a, an elaborate version of your community. And um, appreciate that you are here in Minnesota. Um, and uh, I know this is the first time uh, you come, come to uh, make a request of the state, and we'll do our best to accommodate, you know. Th thank you. Um, I have full faith. If, if you never ask, you know, we'd never know what to, what to do. But thank you for approaching us. Any questions from members? Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. And Senator Kunish, any remark? Um, just I would hope that you would consider this in, in the final bill and recognizing the valuable contribution our Tibetan community members provide and what an enriching experience is to learn about them. Thank you. And we will lay over uh, Senate File 2803 for possible inclusion in the Omnibus Legacy Bill. Thank you. Next bill on the agenda will be number two um, in the order. Uh, that's uh, Senate File 824, uh, Senate Kunish, Minnesota Indian Affairs Council. 
Well, I'll start with Hihane Washte, Ampetukanle, Shante Washte, Marikunish Imakiyapi, Malakota. Um, what I just said in the language of my grandfather is good morning, everybody. I greet you with a warm heart and a hearty handshake. Uh, I am Senator Mary Kunish, and I am Lakota. Uh, and this is important because this uh, language that I'm, I just spoke, I probably learned in only the last four or five years. It was the language of my grandfather, who was um, of, uh, of the Standing Rock Lakota Nation. And while he taught us bits and pieces and you know all the good words that you always learn in other languages, that language was really lost to me and my family, my siblings, my cousins. And so this morning I'm presenting to you Senate File 824. This is an appropriation to the Minnesota Indian Affair Council and it, um, it is primarily around um, preservation preservation of the Dakota and Ojibwe, Ojibwe languages, um, and um, also uh, the appropriation addresses um, the um, responsibility to comply with the Native American Graves Protection and Reparation Act. So for this bill, um, we are asking for $850,000 each year to provide grants to Minnesota tribal nations to preserve the Dakota and the Ojibwe uh, Indian language and to foster education programs. Um, of that amount, um, the full amount, $650,000 each year would go to the Dakota and Ojibwe language immersion educational institutions. 600,000 each year to provide grants to preserve the Dakota and Ojibwe Indian language through the support of projects and services um, uh, and immersion programs. And then uh, $50,000 each year for the Dakota and Ojibwe language working group coordinated by the American Indian um, Council. And then um, the last thing is $150,000 uh, to carry out the responsibility under M Minnesota statute section 307.08 to comply with public law 101-601, the Native American Graves Protection and Reparation Act. And that is my bill. Thank you, Senator Kunish. Uh, Senator Green? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Kunish, um, of the... I guess the, the just just get right to it. How many is this going to be only for uh, children, or is it going to be for adults? How many people are going to be served by this? Do you know, Senator Kunish? I, I don't know the total amount, but there are language immersion programs across the state, both in um, schools and community um, organizations, as well as some of the organized community uh, uh, tribal community groups. I, but I can find out for sure. And I apologize that I don't have my um, expert here today. They weren't able to make it this morning. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's okay. It was just something that I, I would like to know. I don't know that too many other people are really interested in it, but I'd like to know. Um, uh, I do like to know the difference between uh, B and C, paragraphs B and C. You got Because <clears throat> it looks like they're doing the same thing, but can you explain the differences between the two? Um, so, um, um, Mr. Chair and Senator Green, um, in B, this is to foster education programs, uh, language and education programs and services for the language, and then, um, and that's preservation. So that's preservation. C is grants for language immersion education institutions. So where there are programs that have the language immersion programs, that's, uh, that would be letter C. Okay. Then, Mr. Chair, only one thing, and this is something that I hope you look into. Um, all these things, I think, are, are good, not, not questioning them. But I, I am always looking at... Uh, and whether or not they do meet the criteria for legacy, are they, are they, uh, uh, are they helping it? Are they adding to it, or are they substituting for it? Because there might come a day, and this is something that that does worry me, because it's been happening in the past where we had to uh, deal with this, is that grant money has been given out, and then later gone back and found out it didn't meet. And if you don't meet, then it has to be paid back. Mm -hmm. And so just to, just to make sure that 
that these aren't uh, substituting for other programs and that they're actually moving them forward instead of taking the place of money that's already there. Thank you. Uh, Senator Green, or I, I can give a little response to that. Go ahead. Um, Senator Green, uh, uh, each item here uh, has one, one, one time or another received funding under this jurisdiction, so they have history, and it's uh, the uh, description does fit in this jurisdiction, just of legacy. Just, just want to give you a little background information. On, but Senator Kunish, do you have anything to add? Um, no, other than um, basically what you said. You know, they've gone through the the litmus test in the past, um, and I, I think I know what you're talking about. Where um, maybe. Projects that were funded had not been, um, did not quite meet the the um, at, uh, regulations, and I remember that there were some adjustments that had to be d done for a couple of different organizations so that they met that criteria. But I will take this message back to to Maya and let them know, and, and we can work on that for sure. Senator Kulish, any um, closing remark on this? Well, uh, um, you know, I'm a testimony to the fact that um, the language revitalization is alive and healthy, and I'm not the only one. I know hundreds and hundreds of people that have um, started to learn the language of our um, indigenous people, even non-Native folks, lots of non-Native folks. So uh, this is really a wonderful way to, to build that community. Um, but I also want to say that the last part around the um, Native graves Protection and Reparation Act. As we look forward and learn more about um, the boarding schools, the Indian boarding schools, and um, the graves that have been found at almost every single one of them, it's really important that we do that. And if you think about in the last couple of weeks, we heard a story, a news story about Mindot, you know, um, working on a roadway and finding human remains. And under those circumstances, they had to stop and, and they had to, um, there has to be an investigation. And so um, this kind of funding is really important to ensure that we are not disturbing the ancestors. Thank, thank you very much uh, for bringing this bill to help preserve the uh, uh, Indian Lakota and Ojibwe culture. I thought, you know, even going, looking into, self-searching into my own culture, my own culture, which has been through a lot in three, con three countries, from China to Laos to Thailand to here. I thought we lost a lot during that transition, but when I look at our native um, uh, com community here, even lost much more in terms of language and culture. So yeah. we'll do our best to help preserve. And thank you for um, your, your testimony on this bill, and we will lay over Senate File 824 for possible inclusion in the Legacy Omnibus Bill. Next is uh, number three on the agenda, Senate File 664, Santa Kunish, a regional library system. And your test fire is uh, uh, Director Erin Smith. She uh, she's will be on remote. So Senator Kunish, on to the bill. Thank you so much, uh, members and, and uh, audience. This is Senate File 664, um, and we are asking for appropriation of $3 million each year to Minnesota's 12 regional public library systems for art and cultural heritage program. The regional public library system is um, their great le uh, legacy partners because the 356 branch libraries and let me say that again, 356 branch libraries enable free legacy programs to be available to residents throughout the entire state of Minnesota. Legacy funding is important to our regional public library systems because in the public libraries, um, the programs that they provide improve the quality of life for our individuals and they spark community engagement. Um, the programs provided by the public libraries expand cultural awareness. They develop a sense of history and create connections between communities and local artists. The legacy program in public libraries support Minnesota artists, historians, authors, and highlight the rich historical and cultural stories of our state. 
and there are many supporters of this proposal, which has been a mainstay in the legacy bill for, for many years. And so with me, um, we have online Aaron Smith from the Viking Library System in Fergus Falls to offer supporting testimony. Uh, welcome, Director Smith. Uh, please introduce yourself or state your name for the record. Yes, good morning, Chair Howe and committee members. My name is Erin Smith. I'm the director of the Viking Library System, and I'm honored and humbled to be with you today to testify on Senate File 664 on behalf of Minnesota Public Libraries. Thank you to Senator Kunish for authoring the Library Legacy Bill and for her support for the work of Minnesota Public Libraries. Minnesota's 382 public libraries provide every corner of our state with services, resources, and spaces to promote equity, access, opportunity, openness, and connection. Viking Library System is one of 12 regional public library systems serving Minnesota residents. Viking Library System serves the six West Central Minnesota counties of Douglas, Grant, Ottertail, Hope, Stevens, and Travers and we serve 11 member libraries within those counties. Minnesota's public library systems have been the fortunate recipient of arts and cultural heritage programming since 2009. Since 2009 statewide, Minnesota public libraries have held more than 29,885 programs, classes, and events in partnership with arts and cultural organizations independent artists, historical societies, and community organizations. And those free open programs have reached 2,366,945 participants across Minnesota. In the Viking Library System region, legacy funds have made a wealth of arts, cultural heritage, and history programs possible. In many communities we serve, the library is the only organization able to offer free public programs open to all. And library legacy programming has been a true game changer for the libraries and the residents of our region of Minnesota. During the most recent fiscal year, legacy funds supported 34 projects for a total of 176 events that reached 6,686 people. And none of this would have been possible without legacy funding for libraries. As a regional public library system, VLS allocates more than half of its programming funds to local libraries whose staff know their communities best and as such are able to use the funds for maximum impact. The number of requests for funds received from libraries so far this year are far greater than what we saw in 2019. In-person in programming is back at libraries in a big way, but virtual programming also continues to broaden the reach of library events. And here's just a short list of legacy funded programs that are coming up in our region at libraries. We're offering virtual writing classes led by loft teaching artists, and those classes will reach adults and teens, a zine workshop series, author visits with Frank Weber and Alan Eskins, and a seed art workshop with Compass teaching artist Anne mcfall Reek. And all of this greatness, of course, is not just happening in just our region, but all 86 counties in Minnesota. In St. Paul, part of the Metropolitan Library Service Agency, or MELSA, arts and cultural heritage funds supported programs held during Hispanic Heritage and Asian American and Pacific Islanders Heritage Months. The programs brought local artists and presenters to libraries, providing an opportunity for community members to learn, discover, and grow in those heritages. A librarian from the Riverview Library in St. Paul noted that as a result of the programs, staff who self-identified as Hispanic and or AAPI felt encouraged and empowered to share their culture, history, and background experiences with their colleagues. She said, we're, we were able to invest in our communities and our colleagues through this programming. In preparation for National Poetry Month, which is coming up in April, um, and to demonstrate the impact of library legacy funded events in our region, I would like to leave you with a sonnet. The sonnet was written by a parent who took an arts and cultural heritage funded bus trip to the Lake Superior Railroad Museum in Duluth, Minnesota. 
The bus trip was hosted by the New York Mills Public Library. And here's the sonnet. The snow increases as we northward wend through scrubby pines and yellow birchwood groves. The route allows for vistas round each bend for reading and for rest the bust behooves. My children I'm taking to Duluth to see the harbor and to ride the trains. The steam museum sparks the joy of youth that even our teenager cannot feign. They climb aboard and photograph it all. They pull the levers, crane their necks to see. We ride amongst the foliage of the fall while both the girls are cuddled close to me. Though in the end, it makes for quite a day. I wouldn't have it any other way. Thank you. I appreciate your time and support for Senate File 664. Thank you, Director Smith. Uh, any questions from members? Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And to the testifier, I guess, or the author, if she wants, um, you're looking for $6 million. You've done, and that's for 176 events that you did in the last year. That's, uh, I'm trying to figure it out on my calculator, but I didn't get it done in time. But I think that's uh, quite a few thousand dollars per event uh, for uh, around 6,000, 7,000 people. It's kind of a lot of money. Um, but that's just a point to make, but I was wondering from the testifier, can I get a, a detailed list of the 176 events that were put on? Uh, Director you, Smith. Apologies. Thank you, Senator Green, for your comment. Those 176 uh, events were just hosted within the Viking Library System region, and these funds will support all 12 uh, regional libraries systems in the state. Any follow-ups? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, can I get that list from you at some point of, of what the events were? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Senator Green. Thank you, Director Smith. Uh, any further question or discussion? Okay, Senator Kunish, uh, conclusion remark. Um, yes, thank you again for hearing this uh, bill. And, and um, we just have to also recognize it's not just the programs that we heard about this morning that these libraries provide, but this, these libraries are, are like the community huddle spot for uh, early reading opportunities. Um, uh, they support our schools when our teachers need additional resources. Those libraries are there to help, help academia. Uh, if you are studying uh, in higher education and you need a journal or you need an article, those librarians are there to help find those, those um, resources. They help with job search and um, educational purposes. And of course, they always are there to assist with technology. So while uh, we are looking at um, specific things for programming, uh, just remember that there are, there are a lot of other things that these actually 382 libraries provide. So I would ask that you would include this in your omnibus as well, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Kunish, and we will um Lay Center File 664 for possible inclusion in the Legacy Honorable Bill. Thank you. And next is also Senator Kunish Bill, <laughs> Senate File 1268, uh, Great Northern Festival Appropriation. Wonderful. And this is the last one so uh, for, me, for me. So thank yeah. you for indulging me this morning. Uh, members, this is Senate File 1268. And um, we are requesting uh, money for the Great Northern Festival. This bill would all allocate $250,000 per year in 23-24 and 24-25, so a $500,000 request total to the Great Northern, um, to the Great Northern, which operates an annual winter festival in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And I was able to participate a little bit in that this winter on a very, very cold night when there was outdoor um, exhibit to, to be seen. The Great Northern was founded in 2017 in partnership with the City of Lakes Lopet, U.S. Pond Hockey Championships, and St. Paul Winter Carnival as a way to enrich these landmark events with additional complementary expressions of the season. The Great Northern calls on many voices to share what winter culture means to them. 
In addition to celebrating the arts, the outdoor, and the strength of our food scene, the festival's programming, programming also serves as a call to action to protect, water, uh, to protect the winter. We know that there are many ways into the climate conversation and using the arts as a lens through which to bring the issue to the forefront is something the Great Northern does particularly well. This festival's goal is for its attendees from near and far, and I um, actually was at an event and there was a couple, I think they were from Manitoba, who came down to see the exhibit. So when we say near and far, we mean far. To experience the beauty of winter on a cellular level and be inspired and motivated to preserve it for future generation. Now in its seventh year, the, general, uh, the Great Northern is on solid financial footing and is poised for growth. An investment from the state of Minnesota with these legacy dollars would enable the festival to expand its programming, engage with world-class artists and experts, and shine an even brighter light on the winter culture in the Great North. I'm pleased to introduce the Great Northern's Executive and Artistic Director, Kate Nordstrom, who will testify to and answer any questions that you may have. Welcome, Ms. Nordstrom. Please state your name for the record for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify before you today. Thank you, Senator Kunich. My name is Kate Nordstrom, and I'm the Executive and Artistic Director of the Great Northern. So the Great Northern, which Travel and Leisure recently called one of the world's top winter festivals, showcases this community at its wintry best to the rest of the world. This year, we attracted tens of thousands of attendees to more than 70 events that featured a unique combination of art, outdoor, and climate programming. We are poised to scale in a major way, bringing talent, tourism, economic opportunity, and a great return on investment. As Entrepreneur Magazine recently said, the Great Northern is a boon for business. Think of what South by Southwest has done for Austin. Our events attract a growing number of curious and adventurous people from Minnesota and beyond who are eager for uh, fresh perspectives on deep winter, whether it's an outdoor, only in Minnesota dance performance, a robust climate series, or a sampling of more than 20 different sauna experiences. The Great Northern also makes Minnesota an easier place to attract and retain diverse talent. The top recruiting hurdle for local companies we hear time and again is the negative perception of our winters. The Great Northern treats our cold and snow as assets rather than liabilities, and in doing so, we're changing the narrative about this place and our signature season. This year, nearly 140 national and region, regional media stories resulted in 1.1 billion earned media impressions, all telling a positive story about winter in the North. Since our founding in 2017, we've grown our budget to $1 million, um, and during our 2023 festival, 20% 20 of our income came through ticket sales, 80% was from charitable contributions. The Great Northern can be an example of the power and the potential of public and private partnerships with the investment from the state of Minnesota. So we're seeking a legacy appropriation of $250,000 during each year of the biennium to help us expand the breadth and the depth of our climate-based arts conversation and outdoor programming. We'll cultivate robust partnerships, attract diverse talent, and increase access to positive winter experiences for all Minnesotans. The Great Northern celebrates all that the Legacy Amendment was ratified to protect, and we are coming to you for support at a crucial time in our organization's growth. This is the first time asking for support. I respectfully request to be included in the omnibus bill, and thank you so much to the chair for this opportunity. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, any questions from members? I know this is... Uh a routine, hearing me saying the same word, maybe I should record a button every time. <laughs> Any question, remember? I have option button pressing. Okay, well, uh, thank you for your presentation. Any closing comments, uh, Senator Kunish? Just a request to include that in your omnibus bill as well. Okay, and now we'll, uh, we'll lay over Senate file 1268 for possible inclusion in the uh, Legacy Omnibus Bill. Oh, Senator Hoffman, just fly on time. Yep. 
right on time. Um, Senator Hoffman, Senate File 29, we're going to jump to number 8, and this uh, for uh, members that testify that uh, come for my bill, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reorder a little bit and put my bill um, David, yeah. close to the end. And so you want me to do your we're, we're going to jump to Senator Hoffman first. Uh, Senate File 2961, Minnesota Historical Society. On to the bill, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. And uh, Senate File 2961 provides funding for the Minnesota History from the Legacy Amendments Art and Cultural Heritage Fund. As we look back to the Legacy Amendment itself in the Minnesota Constitution, one of the purposes is to preserve Minnesota's history that recognizes the important role that history plays in our state's civic and cultural life. Um, in our educational system for young learners and for lifelong learners, uh, such as those exploring family history and those who enjoy visiting historic places. You getting the theme here, Senator Fong, the history kind of theme where yes. we're going? Minnesota Historical Society and their statewide history partners have preserved and shared Minnesota history for many years. I've personally experienced their dedication to working with diverse groups of Minnesota, including with some of my constituents and friends from the South Asian community. Uh, this bill provides funding for the Minnesota History Society and the History Partners statewide under the Legacy Arts and Cultural Fund. And so with that consideration, Kent Whitworth is here. He's the CEO of the Minnesota Historical Society. David Kelleher, who's the Director of Public Policy um, in Min Min uh, Minnesota History Society. And I think, is Avi here? Too? Is there well, there's Avi. I'll, I'll let Avi come up, and I'll just sit back, and, and I'll let these guys do their thing. So, Mr. Chair and members, welcome to the history. Okay. Uh, state your name for the record, record, whoever want to start first, and welcome, Mr. President, and also uh, my constituents. It's Avi. <laughs> uh, for President, the record, my name is yeah. Kent Whitworth. I serve as the director and CEO of the Minnesota Historical Society. Uh, with me, as Senator Huffman said, is David Kelleher, Director of Public Policy and Governmental Relations, and Avi Vishwanathan, Director of uh, Community Engagement at the Minnesota Historic Society. First of all, I'd like to thank Senator Huffman for authoring this bill and bringing it before the committee and for his enthusiastic support of our organization's work. Chair Her, Vice Chair McEwen, Lead Member Icorn, members of the committee, we thank you for the opportunity to present just a few highlights from the amazing work that has been accomplished by the Minnesota history community over the past year. Uh, we're gonna be working off this report, which I believe is in your packet today. This report is organized by the various programs for which the legislature appropriated funds in this biennium. Uh, we are pleased to share the demonstrated impact of legacy appropriations from the past year. Mr. Chair, we from the Minnesota Historical Society are honored to present this information to you, and we also want to recognize our partners from the many organizations and the individuals who carry out the work of preserving and sharing history across Minnesota. You see on the slide 13 different statewide organizations uh, that, that partner with us, but also want you to think about the uh, countless individual scholars and volunteers and, and uh, more than 400 individual organizations that do history in Minnesota. We are grateful for their partnership. Um, moving on to the next slide, um, I will hand off to Mr. Kelleher, my colleague, to talk a little bit about the language that's in the Constitution regarding this part of the Les Legacy Amendment. Welcome, Mr. Kelleher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. For the record, I'm David Kelleher with the Minnesota Historical Society. Uh, Mr. Chair, the slide that's up on the screen right now is a, an outline of the structure that we have used for many years in, in administering uh, legacy history funds. And as Senator Hoffman said, uh, the, the key language there is to preserve Minnesota's history. That language is in the Minnesota Constitution in the Legacy Amendment. Um, you have passed uh, appropriation bills in recent years that contain this structure. There's a significant grants program there are statewide programs, which are programs operated by the Minnesota Historical Society. There's a partnership category for organizations to work together to conduct a history project. 
there's a program for statewide survey of archaeological and historic sites, and then a, a category for the Minnesota Digital Library. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, this slide and this is, information is also contained in, in the booklet that Kent referenced. This is a quick snapshot of the previous biennial appropriations for history. I'll say a few words about the grants program, and this is where a lot of uh, you and your constituents will, will interface with history legacy. The grants program is a competitive grants program. It is administered by the Minnesota Historical Society, but we have a volunteer group that reviews applications and makes recommendations to our governing board. We have administered more than 3,000 grants in all 87 counties across Minnesota over the life of the Legacy Amendment. These are for history programs, museum collections, and environments, and preserving historic structures. We break those up into categories of large grants and small grants. Uh, the Historic Resources Advisory Committee uh, takes a lead role in the large grants. The small grants are available in three to four rounds each year. Of the thousands of grants, uh, it's hard to pick out one or two, but uh, one that just has a really interesting backstory is pictured here in, in Minneapolis, uh, 45th and Hiawatha. There's a building that right now would look like a nondescript uh, industrial building, but there's a really deep history behind that. And that was, when it was built, was a fire station, Fire Station 24, and it was a, f a fire station that housed a segregated uh, fire force, and it was African-American firefighters that were there. That story had been forgotten, but it's been recovered by some local citizens who wanted to preserve that story and preserve that structure and tell that story. Mm -hmm. uh, that group applied for a grant to write a, a nomination for that building to be on the National Register of Historic Places, and they're on their way to doing that work. So just one of many, many stories. Uh, a few other examples, uh, the Wasioja uh, Recruiting Station has received a grant, and then the William Irvin uh, up in Duluth has received a grant. That was one of the larger grants to take care of that um, massive structure. Again, the Historic Resources Advisory Committee, a citizen group, and you could see them there at work. They spend two days. They spend a lot of time reviewing um, the grant applications, and they typically have 100-plus applications, and they volunteered more than 500 hours in each cycle, and they work off of a paperless application system. I would also mention that if you have constituents who are interested in doing history projects, the grants office that administers these funds is, is here to help. They offer um, monthly open houses and the grant staff does a tremendous amount of outreach along with our field services staff, so please let us know how we can help connect you to those resources. Not only the funding, but the technical assistance as well. In your booklet, there's a map of all the grants uh, that have been uh, distributed across the state, and you can see county by county where those dollars have gone. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, I will turn to my colleague, Avi, uh, to talk about statewide programs. Oh, welcome, and please state your name for the record. So my name is uh, Avi Vishwanathan, and I am the Director of Community Engagement with the Minnesota Historical Society. I actually think... Kent was going to jump in and Sorry. say one other yes, thing before uh, that, though. Uh, Mr. Chair, if you don't mind, before yes. Avi uh, uh, highlights several programs, I'd like to provide a little more context uh, from a, an institutional perspective. And I'll just uh, quickly point to the mission that has uh, been adopted in the last uh, year and a half. Uh, we take that opening statement, we serve all the people of Minnesota very seriously. Um, in some respects, that's aspirational, but we are working hard day in and day out to build the kind of relationships and the kind of trust and rapport with all communities across Minnesota. So we want to put that out there, hold ourselves accountable, and acknowledge that that is a journey. Um, I'd also like to say just a few um, words about the strategic plan that was adopted at the same time that mission statement was updated. And I'll just touch very briefly on these four strategic imperatives. But again, it, it, it tells you where our head and heart is, so to speak, as an organization. Transforming 
Screen Access is, is about not only engaging existing audiences in more meaningful ways, but about attracting new audiences and frankly removing barriers in the way we operate so that all Minnesotans can access uh, our programs and our resources. When we talk about re-envisioning space, we talk about pushing history to all corners of Minnesota, beyond the confines of our historic night, uh, site network. And when we think about expertise and the expansion of expertise and authority, for all of us, we feel like MNHS plays a role to encourage a deeper understanding of how history is created, how it works, and then how history can inform contemporary issues. Um, so we are not the sage on the stage, if you will. We do have expertise and authority, but there is expertise uh, found across the state in many different communities, and uh, this is about expanding that sense of expertise and authority. And finally, uh, the rubber's got to meet the road, so we need to think about sustainability. And that, for us, really uh, focuses on alignment and um, alignment between our programmatic offerings and our financial and human resources. So uh, very, at a very, very high level, that are, those are the four strategic imperatives that shape um, uh, the future of this organization. So with that, I'll turn to Avi to talk more specifically about programming. Now to you, Mr. Avi. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Woodmore. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Again, my name is Avi Vishwanathan, and I am the Director of Community Engagement with the Minnesota Historical Society. Um, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about our statewide programs. And one way to think about our different activities is to group them into these three um, different types of activities, preserving, sharing, and connecting. Uh, when we're referring to preserving, that's again, preserving the history of Minnesota in, in uh, a number of different ways. One of the ongoing projects that we have is digitization of Minnesota's newspapers. Um, we have over 5 million pages of newspapers scanned into a system, our newspaper hub that uh, every Minnesotan has access to um, from newspapers all across the state, culturally specific, geographically broad uh, newspaper collections. In addition, we have oral history projects. Uh, oral history projects are a, a great way for communities and people across Minnesota to share their stories um, from themselves in a way that we can record and share. Uh, one of my, uh, one of the more interesting projects that I've come across um, that was in oral history project is uh, uh, people who were sharing their stories about Adney Lake in Crow Wing County. Uh, there was a group of black Minnesotans from Minneapolis who purchased property along the lake and would travel there um, and use the lake recreationally. Uh, and we did an oral history project to hear those stories about how uh, Minnesotans um, gathered together and what they did together uh, up in that space. And we also have cataloging of important uh, archaeological collections. Our collections are a, a very important part um, of what we do. And uh, the next bullet point there, preserving and making Native American collections and archives available. We want those collections, we want the things that we archive to be available to the communities um, from which they come. So that includes Native American uh, collections and also other culturally specific and cultural communities collections that we have in our space. Uh, sharing. Sharing is our, um, you know, that, that's fundamental to what we do. So we preserve the history, but we want people to be able to interact with it, to learn from it, uh, to see it. Um, our exhibits are a, a great example of some of the work that we've been able to do. This is an image of the um, Our Home Native Gallery uh, that we have at the History Center, specifically um, uh, developed in partnership with Native communities across the state and our Native American Initiatives Department. Um, we also have interpretive signage at different historic sites where there's also a process of engagement that we're working um, with different communities on. This is a First Avenue exhibit, so an exhibit about culturally um, really important Minnesota history and culture that a lot of people have interacted with. Uh, we also had um, a We Are Hmong exhibit in uh, a few years ago at the History Center, sharing the stories, uh, again, in partnership and relationship with people from that community. Uh, we had a Somalis in Minnesota exhibit shortly thereafter. Again, that partnership in sharing the stories of all Minnesotans. Um, Senator Hoffman actually referred to the South Asian community. We also had an exhibit called Beyond Bollywood prior to those uh, about the South Asian community. And I mentioned our home. 
native Minnesota. I uh, hear a couple of examples of artifacts that are from members of the community um, that we have in that in that particular exhibit. Um, and then we also have uh, exhibits at our sites in Greater Minnesota. This is uh, Women of the Big Lake at the Mille Lacs um, Indian Museum, which was created in partnership um, with the community there to honor women of, uh, of Mille Lacs and to have that history be part of what we share out of that site as well. Uh, and then connecting. A big part of our work is, is you know, through that sharing and that collecting, making sure that people are connecting with each other also. Um, we have curriculum development and educator support so that students are learning from uh, the resources that we have and connecting with what we have and also learning from each other. Um, legacy field trip support is another example of bringing, uh, giving people the opportunity and students the opportunity to come to the History Center and interact with different objects and exhibits and history. Um, diversity outreach, we're consistently looking to build new relationships and connections with different communities um, all across the state. Uh, that's a lot of the work of my department in community engagement is that relationship building so that those exhibits and that history um, and the things that we're sharing are more powerful and connected deeply to those stories. Um, we've had a couple of different fellowship programs where we have worked with different communities um, and students at both undergraduate and graduate um, level to uh, participate in learning more about the history field and then have internships within the uh, field and in the historical society to go deeper and then move out and have a different impact on the public history and museum fields. Um, we also have public programs where we share uh, through different events and gatherings. Here we have two examples um, that we did in February. On the left is an image of uh, women who worked in a munitions plant. Um, that was part of a program we called Invisible Warriors, which was women who worked in a, black women specifically, who worked in a munitions plant in the Twin Cities during World War II. Um, and on the right, we have the story of Buffalo Soldiers at Fort Snelling, and that was, um, also we had did a program through, um, through uh, Fort Snelling where we shared information about Buffalo Soldiers and uh, black soldiers post-Civil um, uh, post War out of Fort Snelling. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the next category of appropriations that have been made in the past are history partnerships. These are opportunities for multiple organizations to work together to conduct a, a common history project. These can be uh, projects that are done with the Minnesota Historical Society or other organizations that do not include the Minnesota Historical Society. And you can see a couple of examples on this slide. Uh, the Northern Bedrock Historic Preservation Corps is a good example of a partnership uh, to carry out some of that history work. Fourth category is the statewide survey of historical and archaeological sites. This provides an opportunity for us to better understand um, what is out there. We will work either in a theme or in a geographical area to learn more about what's there and that will provide a base of information for uh, future work in archaeology. A few images of uh, the work that's been done there. And then finally, the Minnesota Digital Library is uh, a collaboration between the Minnesota Historical Society, Minitex, and other history partners. Uh, they have created a, a database of images that are searchable uh, online. Got some images there from Brainerd and Duluth and other spots. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, finally, the Minnesota History Coalition that Kent referenced earlier is of the, the or various organizations doing this history work uh, is bringing forward what's contained in this bill. Uh, this is a request for 33% of the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. We've requested this level of funding, one third uh, in the past. We haven't quite gotten there, but these amounts based on the November forecast uh, represent uh, one third of the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund for history. So uh, with that, Mr. Chair, uh, that wraps up what we have to say, and we're very happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Any question from members? Uh, Senator Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll make this quick because I'm probably not understanding the bill because you're asking for uh, $13.75 million per year, but in the bill that's both in A and B. So you've got uh, basically 27.5 and 27.5 um, uh, is, is B the same as A? What's, what's the ask? 
Yeah. Senator Hoffman or Mr. Keller? Mr. Hoffman. Keller. Mr. Chair, Senator Green, um, th those amounts are identical and they're different programs. The first one is the statewide competitive grants program, and the second one is programs that are administered by the Minnesota Historical Society at Historic Sites in the History Center. And those amounts have been generally even uh, over time to have some balance between the work that we do and the work that other organizations do. Senator Green. Thank you. So the, the ask is really closer to sixty million. Um, I was a history Mr. Major, Kelleher? Not a math major, but uh, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Green, yes, it, it represents a third of thirty-three percent of what's available based on the November forecast from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Okay. Okay. Any further qu discussion questions? One thing I forgot uh, throughout the number of bills is ask any, if any members in the audience want to testify. Okay. Then, Senator Hoffman, closing Ms. remarks. Ms. Mr. Chair, you got a history, you got a, you got a historian sitting right behind me, uh, Senator Cohen. Maybe, you know, he could give a, you know, he could tell us 30 minutes worth of uh, history on the, <laughs> on the piece here. I, I'm looking forward to, to seeing him again. So. It really is important. This really delineates between the physical infrastructure asks that the History uh, uh, Society, Minnesota History Center, uh, puts in place, you know, i.e., you know, like the work we had done for the Oliver Kelly Farm, the work we had done, you know, Fort Snelling, all the work that the infrastructure work. This really gets to the program and services side of it, which is elevating the rich history. And, and, and one in particular, when you talk about how do we access information online? Well, you got to digitize, and there's so much paper that they have stuffed in their vault, and, and yet there's a piece of history in the vault that I've yet to see, uh, that I've been asking to see for many years, and maybe, Senator Herr, we should do a tour of that vault to see a certain flag from a certain state that, that uh, has uh, captured during the Civil War that we still proudly own and, and have, and they're not getting it back, and I'd sure love to see that. How about you? Yes, I, I will too, and we, we should take a tour of the Historical Society or History Center, you know, just for that reason, and there's a number of artifacts, I'm sure, that, uh, you know, we will be intrigued uh, to see, and uh, Senator Cohen is on the schedule here <laughs> to talk about the history of our committee, the Legacy Committee, I love it. and then take it, I, I show him on my Facebook before I serve on the Senate. Uh, it was November 16th, 2009. I took a picture of him at the event uh, where a award was given to him about the legacy amendment. And so that's part of history too, but it's on my Facebook. <laughs> thank you. I will invite him later. later I, I after, love after it. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Chair, thank you. And thank you for caring about history in Minnesota. This is a great, we know this is a great organization. Proud to be, be part of it. And, and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Senator Hoffman. Thank you. And, we will, and thank you, uh, CCO uh, Whitworth and Mr. Avi and, you know, Mr. Kelleher for your testimony. And so we'll lay over Senate file uh, 2961 for possible inclusion in the Legacy Anonymous Bill. Next is our esteemed senator um, who worked very hard to get us going on many aspects, including capital investment, and we had to pull her, pull her out of judiciary to be here. Uh, senator Sandy Pappas, Senate File 407, Sign Museum of Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to be back here with you again uh, with another wonderful um, request from, for legacy funding. Uh, members of the committee, I'm here in support of Senate File 407, the Science Museum of Minnesota's 2425 legacy request that would fund their statewide science education and equity initiative. I'm joined by John Severson, the Director of Strategic Partnerships and Government Relations. I'm pleased to be here because the Science Museum, which is in my district, is of such great importance to not only my district, but to all of Minnesota. The museum is nationally recognized for excellence in its educational programming, exhibit development and production, and leading role in tackling the challenging topics of race and equity through its award-winning exhibit, Race, Are We So Different?, which toured to nearly 60 cities and has been seen by over 4 million visitors. 
The Science Museum experience is unique among our Minnesota cultural institutions, one that emphasizes hands-on learning and helps all Minnesotans see themselves in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math careers. We need the Science Museum now more than ever. Um, recently, I've, I'm a frequent um, visitor to the Science Museum. It's a place I like to take out-of-town visitors. And last summer, I was fortunate enough to have my 17-year-old granddaughter and, from Israel and a friend visiting. Um, they do speak some English. Uh, so we then, we took in the Omni Theater show at that time. And I don't think they'd ever seen an Omni Theater before. So it was quite an experience for them. The Science Museum leverages legacy dollars to raise additional funding to serve students and educators throughout the state. They're not just a <clears throat> St. Paul or a metro-centric um, operation. As you'll hear shortly, the museum also uses legacy funds to connect with Minnesota's traditionally underrepresented communities to help shape science museum programs that welcome and serve all Minnesotans now and into the future. Oh, I forgot to mention that years ago, my middle daughter actually was worked at the Science Museum. She had, she was in eighth grade, I think, and they were hiring like eight, I don't know if you still do this or not, John, but they were hiring like young people to come in and work with other young people like themselves with, uh, to do some hands-on hands learning experiments. So that was really a lot of fun for her one summer. Um, the legacy helps, uh, funds help support the preservation, interpretation, and digitalization of the over two million objects in the museum's research collections. And it continues to innovate and find ways to serve Minnesota. I strongly encourage members' support. And now I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Severson. Welcome, Mr. Severson. Please state your name for the Thank record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, I am John Severson. I have the honor of serving as the Director of Strategic Partnerships and Government Relations at the Science Museum of Minnesota. Uh, I will start with an apology. Uh, I realize the irony. I had a PowerPoint presentation, uh, but I did not bring the adapter on my computer. Uh, so that is the technology in STEM. So we are not immune to that. Um, I will also um, say thank you to Senator Pappas for her leadership and longstanding support of the museum uh, and her leadership in District 65. Um, I will open by giving you a very brief snapshot of the current financial situation of the museum. Uh, this has been re featured recently in a Star Tribune article. Um, I know that we are very all eager to move on uh, from the lasting impacts of the COVID pandemic, uh, but the science, science museums, uh, science centers, and children's museums across the country are recovering more slowly uh, than other uh, element, uh, members of the uh, cultural institution sector. Uh, and so with that, we are facing some uh, financial challenges this year and have taken steps in the last week to right-size our staff. Uh, this was a very difficult decision uh, for the museum, uh, but we want to be very transparent with this committee on where we are. Um, but that does not mean that uh, we will not continue to do the great work and welcome visitors from across the state. Um, I will share that legacy support is foundational to the museum's ability to develop innovative STEM curriculum and to serve Minnesota students through our outreach programs, hands-on field trips, and professional development programs for educators and administrators across Minnesota. Uh, there are slides that were available, and if you do not have them, we're happy to provide them to you. But uh, one of the slides is a map of Minnesota, which we uh, are very happy to share uh, when, we, when we meet with senators. Um, it shows that we did touch 70 of 87 counties in 2022, which is an increase from the prior year as we build back from the pandemic. Uh, we are also very proud to share that in the seven years prior to the pandemic shutdown, we were able to serve all 87 counties for seven years in a row. This remains a goal of the museum and legacy funding will help us uh, achieve that. Also on that slide, um, there's a slide saying that since 2007 that the museum has touched over, impacted over 1.6 million students and 128,000 educators. Uh, that does slightly predate the start of Legacy, but Legacy has been uh, an instrumental uh, funding source in helping us do that. So today, uh, we are asking for your consideration of $1,740,000 over the coming biennium. Uh, this does represent a 24% increase over our current appropriation of 1.4 million. Uh, but the funding will continue to support the outstanding re results achieved with our statewide science, education, and equity initiative, which builds on the work to deepen our impact with Minnesota families and communities and provide greater online access to our Minnesota-based collect collections. Um, 
this, the state sources represent less than 10% of the museum's $32 million budget, uh, with legacy funding representing roughly 2%. Of the remaining funds, 3% come from a general operating appropriation, uh, also heard before this committee, uh, and 5% comes from competitive environment and natural resource trust funds grants that power our scientific research. Uh, also, with a nod to uh, the, the former presenters, uh, we are the recipients of uh, a couple of small um, historical society grants that power our anthropological um, research. Uh, there's a, a site in southwest Minnesota, the uh, specific location of which is remains um, sequestered at the, at the request of the family, but it has been an incredibly productive site uh, in, in discovering uh, the first peoples of Minnesota. So although uh, this is not a majority revenue stream, the 2% does, uh, represented by legacy, is essential. And as I said, it allows us to develop the innovative STEM curriculum that we do share with the state. Um, we, have, uh, we are fortunate to have strong funding from individuals and corporations, but this is unique funding in that it, it gives us the opportunity to develop those programs. Um, other funders really like to help spread the impact of that, but these are key sources for that. Uh, so, our current bill builds on the strengths of the programs previously supported by this committee and helps audiences better access science museum resources, and they fall into three main categories. Uh, really supporting our statewide school outreach and continuing to understand and respond to the STEM learning needs of our communities and schools. Uh, really working through our Department of Museum Access and Equity to develop educational programs that equi equitably meet the needs of Minnesota families. And as we think about our collections, amplifying the connection of science and culture through the museum's research, collections, and collaborations. Uh, with a full funding of our request, the museum will seek to build on current successes and add new elements to our work. Uh, with this, uh, as, I, as I shared, the science, uh, the science outright <coughs> statewide school outreach programs, uh, an example of one piece that we are looking to build on is uh, automata kits, which are absolutely... Uh, fantastic. They are engineering kits designed around cultural stories uh, and provided free to fourth and fifth grade classrooms. Uh, currently we have kits developed around Hmong, Mayan, and Ojibwe stories that have been very popular with teachers and students. And I'll show you an example of this. It's, it's very simple, but it is an engineering kit. And the benefit of this, and I'll pass these around for folks, uh, the benefit of these kits is that BIPOC students uh, who historically experience exclusion from STEM narratives see their cultures represented in a multilingual STEM-focused classroom. And here is an, another example. This is a um, story of the sun, sun and the moon. And I will leave these for, uh, I'm going to leave these uh, for the committee. Um, secondly, the Science maybe, Museum. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Stevenson, maybe you can have, yeah. have the page grab and pass yeah. around yeah. our members. Yeah. We can just, the page will come up. And yeah, perfect. Them. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, secondly, the Science Museum will work collaboratively with communities to understand their goals and align museum resources and programming to those needs. Uh, another highlight that I would like to call out is a program we're calling the Community Curator Program. Uh, this is in a pilot phase right now, but with a legacy funding we would be able to expand this and provide stipend for community members. Uh, and what the program would do would highlight the voices and experiences of indigenous and new Minnesotans whose cultures are represented in our collections but whose perspectives have been traditionally underrepresented. Uh, what we hope to do with this program, there's a great slide, a, a picture of the, uh, of, the, of the collections. The program will really help marginalized communities see the museum as a place that values their stories, which is key to our, our work. And lastly, as we think about amplifying the connection of science and culture through the museum's research collections and collaborations, uh, we will continue to do work, as, as the History Center shared. Uh, digitization of our collections is an incredibly important part of our work. We do have two million objects, uh, of which maybe three to four percent are ever on the floor at the Science Museum at any one time. Uh, and this will make this information available to classrooms, researchers, and the public uh, across Minnesota and, and literally ar around the globe. Uh, and in a true intersection of arts and science, uh, the museum is hoping to expand the equitable access to artists and writers who participate in the Pine Needles Residency Program. Uh, the residency program is a long-standing uh, artist residency uh, at the St. Croix Watershed Research Station, which is on Marine on St. Croix. Uh, historically, this has been an unpaid an opportunity. We've had a lot of educators who've been able to do this, 
Uh, but with a stipend, we would be able to broaden the pool of folks who would be able to make that, uh, make that a reality. And we find that this is important um, because we really want to add to the perspectives of artists who, who enhance our understanding of environmental sciences through their work. Uh, with that, I want to thank you for your past support and consideration of a full request of the Science Museum of Minnesota's priority projects in fiscal 24-25. Uh, a legacy appropriation will help us ensure we continue serving students and families across Minnesota with excellent and culturally re relevant informal STEM education. And with that, uh, we stand available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Um, I should stand green. Before that, just want to make a little announcement that we have tangerine. Our, our staff is passing tangerine to, to the member audience for being patiently listened to our bills thus far. So, uh, Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have just two questions, and I'll just ask them. Um, first of all, can I get a detailed list of, of uh, the educational initiatives and community-based exhibits that, you, that you've done in the past, and, uh, and maybe a cost on those? Mm -hmm. And then also, I'm just wondering, what did it cost to make those little uh, things you had there? <laughs> Senator Green. Oh, no, Senator Green. That's Mr. Stevenson. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Green, thank you for those questions. Uh, honestly, Senator, I will have to follow up with your office on the exact cost of these. Uh, I don't have the breakdown in front of me, uh, and I'm, we're very happy to provide that list. All right, thank you. Um, yeah. The interesting question, Senator Green, yeah. just uh, how you are so detailed to... <laughs> The, the, the my new my my new item of, of uh, the project. But um, any other questions from uh, members? Okay. Well, Senator right. pa Senator Pappas, closing remark. Thank you good? again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. All right. We'll uh, we'll lay over Senate File 407 for possible inclusion in the Legacy Anonymous Bill. And next, Senator Dibble. Yep. Welcome to the committee. And Senator Dibble's um, bill is, is on its way uh, for, for jacketing. Um, the language is in your package. So if, if you don't have one, let, let us know. It's uh, under S, it's, uh, let's see, SC0358-1 right now. That's kind of like the uh, revisor number. So, uh, Senator Dimple, on to your legislation. Great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members. I especially appreciate the accommodation of hearing this idea in concept, given that you don't have a bill in front of you at this moment. So. Um, very generous, um, and I very much appreciate the consideration. Um, and uh, uh, before I get going, um, there's, w there's one correction. Um, the grant would be made to the YWCA, Minneapolis, not the YMCA, okay. um, which will be correct um, when the jacket is uh, produced yeah. and, uh, and it's an actual bill. Um, so, uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, Camille Joy Gage was a remarkable member of our community and state. It would be insufficient uh, to simply call her an artist because her contributions to creating a better world and future were so much more extensive. But to be sure, art was the common thread through uh, everything she did in her life and, and her engagements. And her engagements were very focused on pulling people together, thus creating connections, uh, relationships, a sense of place and time and of community. And though her achievements were notable and she didn't lack for attention, the practical, tangible support for her work was often lacking. And this was even more so as she advanced uh, in her years. Uh, I would note parenthetically, uh, we lost Camille um, just a few months ago. Um, well, she wasn't, and she was far too young. I might have suggested in my last uh, uh, sentence that she was elderly. She, she wasn't. Um, she was uh, a little older than I was, so we lost her too young. But she was, uh, for an artist and a woman, uh, uh, 
definitely in her more mature years and lacked uh, some of the practical and tangible support that I would hope that our community would be able to offer someone who is uh, doing such important work. So, the, so hence the idea for this fellowship came about as a way to find other people who are carrying on her legacy and who are also lacking the sustained support for the positive contributions they've been making with a broader scope than just art, but using art as a means of engagement and for positive action. So you'll look to the bill and it describes a little bit about the characteristics of her and her work and the fellowship that would be created in her honor and legacy uh, would, would amplify and reflect that. Uh, gathering and amplifying the unique artistic voices of others, uh, weaving those diverse artistic voices uh, into a force for community building, uh, demonstrating a concern for others' art, a uh, deep concern that uh, community be welcoming and just, and maximizing artistic opportunities for others, and bringing art outside of the more formal spaces and into our everyday lives. Um, with me, Mr. Chair, is Joan Vorderbruggen, who uh, was a colleague and a friend of Camille's, as well as a good friend of Camille's family, uh, and has worked closely with Camille on a number of community projects and has been a big support and help in uh, rallying the community voices and helping develop this idea. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you, Senator Debo, and welcome, Ms. Uh, Bordenberger. Uh, please state your name for uh, the record before, and then testify. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Joan Vorderbruggen, and I am a community arts organizer, a public health nurse, and a public art consultant. I've been working and living in the Twin Cities metro area for very many years, and Camille was a mentor, a collaborator, and a friend to me for a very long time. Um, I worked outside of the intersection of art and community and economic development. I was a nurse who had a passion for my neighborhood and worked very hard to put together various projects that were outside of institutions and outside of our nonprofit system. And Camille was a huge champion and a huge teacher to me. She also was a very early adopter to a lot of the projects and initiatives that I brought forward and championed the fact that there are so many individuals who leverage neighborhoods and community with arts initiatives and creativity that really resides outside of some of our formal institutions and our nonprofit systems. And they're community champions. And they don't do this work because it's a part of their job, it's part of their professional role, or it's something that they feel they um, are accountable to. They do it because it's a core part of their being and who they are as a person. And it just so happened that Camille was an extraordinarily talented, multi-dimensional artist. And she had the ability to mobilize other creatives around her to create a collective impact that was so much bigger than anything that any of us could possibly do on our own. And there are many individuals working in this similar way. And when I think about this opportunity and what it might have meant for Camille, what she could have done with these resources paired with a platform of a nonprofit organization that has a reach such as the YWCA, it would have been nothing short of extraordinary and hugely impactful for a very broad swath of the community. Um, I cherish memories of Camille. Every time we would get together, I would leave uh, spending time with her and I would just say to myself, oh my God, now we have to do this. <laughs> And it was always either a very, very ambitious project that involved you know, tens or even hundreds of different creatives to something as simple as making sure that every mother and child staying in an emergency shelter had access to a plate of holiday cookies. It didn't matter. She was always working and always visioning and always thinking about how to mobilize everyone around her to do good in the community. So I thank you for your consideration. Thank you, uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Bordenberger. Um, any question from member Senator Green? Um, uh, this is to, either to Senator Dibble or or the testifier. I'm reading through this. Is this uh, is this money just to hire a person to do these things? Is that what this is for? Because I'm trying to understand how where the money's going to go, and it it gives uh, five thousand dollars for administrative expenses. And the rest, just like you're picking somebody to do a job. So is this just for a person, just to hire a person? Senator Dibble. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Green. Um, I guess that would be a way of looking at it, but uh, fellowships are, are construed uh, somewhat differently. It wouldn't be hiring someone as an employee uh, per se, but rather supporting um, you know, work. I mean, so it would, it would come about, of course, through an application process, um, similar to uh, how um, grants are made uh, you know, in a, in a traditional sense, uh, artists would either nominate themselves or be nominated by others um, uh, to, you know, the governing board of the, of the YWCA and propose to bring a, 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 a package of work um, to engage in the ways that uh, the selection criteria describes. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so it would be a competitive grant-making process, if you will, um, you know, f you know, f just like any grant, um, you know, would then be um, accountable to um, the criteria that have been uh, established, um, and uh, of course there would be, uh, you know, uh, an accountability and reporting mechanism. So, um, I guess in in some sense, yes, yeah, someone's being hired to do a job, but in 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 essence, um, people who are already doing uh, tremendous work in this space. Um, would be asked to step forward and, and it would continue to perpetuate and support that work under the auspices of this institutional support from the YWCA. Would Senator Green? Just one more question, Mr. Chair, then. So um, would you be picking a new, well, for lack of a better word, they're going to be employed. So uh, are you picking a new employee every year? Does it go on or do you pick one and they're in there for a number of years? Uh, Senator Dibble. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Green, thank you for the question. Um, I think by its very nature, the uh, legacy funds are appropriated uh, and renewed. Uh, by their nature, are, are one-time funds. Um, so this, you know, so th this would, you know, in in all likelihood, because this is is um, is, is two two sets. So this would be uh, fiscal year 2024 and 2025, and then, you know, the legislature would then have the opportunity to look afresh to see if this was a good idea or not and uh, whether or not to continue it. So the short answer to your question is no, this would not be ongoing funds by its nature. Legacy funds are one time, so. Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Senator Green. Thank you, Senator Dibble. That wasn't really my question. I'll, I'll make it more simple here. You've got two years of funding. So would you be picking a new person every year or once you pick a person, would they do both years? That was my question. Is it going to be a grant program that extends out, or is it just straight? Senator Dibble. So, Mr. Chair, um, my intent um, uh, of, the, of the bill is for actually the YWCA to make that determination if, in fact, they wanted to. It says an annual fellowship, um, and so quite literally it would be, you know, someone would receive the fellowship, and then someone else would receive um, uh, uh, the next fellowship in the following year. I, I think the language, and maybe Mr. Stanley can help me, is flexible enough that if, in fact, um, the YWCA determines for itself that um, it would be a fellowship that would last for two years, they would have that opportunity. Mr. Stanley. Mr. Chair, members, I agree with what Senator Dibble said. The language does provide for an annual fellowship, but there's nothing in the bill that would prevent the YWCA from selecting the same person for both years. Yeah, any any follow-up question? And uh, uh, just my comments for uh, the uh, the fellowship, it take many fold. It take the competitive sector, you know, where you offer uh, folks the opportunity, but at the same time also um, give, it also uh, present a person with the decision-making whether they want to take the chance for competitive grant as well. So that's a big decision for any applicants or any fellowship, you know, it, to to decide whether they want to take that route. It's a noble route, but whether they want to do that and then um, then move on to competitive uh, grant um, section. And so, you know, it's it's a it's a well vetted and it's also a, dis a personal decision of someone that will follow the legacy of Ms. Camille Gage, an artist, and so, you know, um, it's life-changing at the same time also um, society-impacting decision. So 
thank you for bringing this uh, legislation Great. forward. And so, thank you. Senator Tipo, any uh, final remark? No, uh, Mr. Chair, I appreciate very much your consideration of this. I think it would be um, a tremendous opportunity, not just for the individual or individuals, but a tremendous opportunity for our larger community and our state. Uh, and um, I also, again, want to express my very, very sincere gratitude for being so generous as to allow this to be heard absent uh, having been formally introduced at this point. So thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Oh, we'll, we'll make it possible. So we will lay Senate file. Um, now it's uh, still arbitrary, but it's the Camille Gage Artist Fellowship for possible inclusion. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you. Next is... Uh, Senator Wisenberg, uh, Bill Senate File 2534. And I believe Senator Wisenberg has an amendment. Okay. And again, enjoy the tangerine that we pass around. Uh, if, if it's not back there, it's probably back over here. It's still back there. Okay. And I did find a testifier for 4-H also. So Mike Wiener. Okay. Great. Um, I, do you have the amendment? I haven't been given it to myself yet. Yep. Okay, the, um, the bill and the amendment is uh, it's in your package. It's also posted online for audience member or anyone that might be interested. Oh, and this is the amendment, right? Okay. All right, thank you, Chair and Committee. Um, so I'm, again, we talked about this yesterday, so we, I talked to our, uh, uh, Chair Her last night, and uh, we decided to just bring this forward as a bill. So this is a bill to appropriate money for um, preserving our hunting and sporting heritage and you know teaching young adults about firearm safety. So there's a 4-H program at the University of Minnesota that a couple uh, students that go there came and said that the, there's not really any funding for this, so I'm just trying to help them with their endeavors. Um, so the bill, do you, again, I, so, I was, so was it, you want to, since you're a member of our committee, do you yes. want a motion that we adapt the uh, would A1 you, amendment? Yes. Would, would we, uh, uh, adopt the A1 amendment to this bill? Okay. All in favor in, in adopting the A1 amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. aye. Okay. Motion pr prevail. So on to the bill as amended. So the bill would provide $50,000 in fiscal year 2024 and $50,000 in fiscal year 2025 to the University of Minnesota Extension Office to provide grants to the Minnesota 4-H chapters uh, that have members participate, participating in the state national 4-H uh, shooting sports. Um, so that it would just go for that and to help them with, with their sport. Um, and I'll let Mike Wiener talk here a little bit about uh, the importance of this. So thank you. Well, welcome to the committee. Uh, please state your name for the record. My name is Mike Wiener. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, committee, for having me here today. Um, as a past member of 4-H, and my kids participate in 4-H as well, uh, I see this bill as being uh, very crucial to continuing the, uh, continuing the sport. Um, a lot of high schools don't offer shooting sports, and a lot of non-traditional students don't have access as well. And this bill would bridge that gap so that students would have the opportunity to participate in uh, what is the fastest uh, high school sport in the state of Minnesota. Um, shooting sports have a long and great tradition. And if I, I could draw your attention to the, the seal of the great state of Minnesota, there is a firearm in, in the lower corner of that. Uh, the history and tradition goes back all the way to the the Greeks and Romans, really, with the, the javelin in the Middle Ages where... Uh, archery was the competition, and now the modern version of this is shooting sports. It is uh, incredibly safe, um, and uh, it's a great opportunity for kids to learn the heritage, shape, safe shooting skills, and participate in this great activity. So thank you for, for allowing me to testify today, and if we have any questions, I'd be, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Any questions from members? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you for bringing the bill. Uh, Representative Wiener, you're the testifier here today. So uh, when they uh, um, put these, these uh, sports into the schools, 
Do they come with safety training uh, for the kids? Uh, Mr. Weir. Winner. Uh, is it? Weiner. Winner. Mr. Winner. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and yes, Senator. Um, there is extensive training that goes along with the handling um, before there's any shooting that takes place. Uh, strict protocol are in place. A lot of times there's a teacher or an outside instructor that takes, uh, takes charge of that, and I believe to the best of my knowledge there has not been a single um, serious accident at any one of these events. So, Thank you. All right, any discussion? Well, uh, we'll... And closing remarks, Senator Wisselberg? Yes, uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I, I would like to add, too, I would like to ask for when they have this money, I kind of want to see a breakdown of how they're distributing it so we know where it's going within the realm of the university. So I just, myself, I like to see where all the money goes. You know, if they have the $50,000, and then they can maybe divide it so we can see where that goes. Um, there is a constituent that sent me a letter. If it, is that okay if I read her letter? I sent... I, uh, sure, sure. Okay. I, I, so, I, I want to uh, respond to um, what you just say there. Yep. I, you, you, you will have to talk to the University of okay. Minnesota if okay. you'd like to get that. And we can, we can request that as well. Okay. You know, but that will be your, the fiscal agent and that will just manage the, the use of the funding. And okay. you, you'll make sure. And if they, they don't do it well, you know, I don't think you'll want to send them money again yeah. for the same thing. <laughs> Thank so, you, Mr. Yeah, Chair. Right, yeah. um, so this is a, a, a young constituent of mine. Um, I actually, I got on the phone after I found out and a whole bunch of people started contacting me saying how grateful they were that, you know, this is going to help them because there's not a lot of money or this is all self-funded things. But uh, Senator Wiesenberg, my name is Haley Schilling. I am in the sixth grade and I'm 12 years old. Thank you for all that you're doing to protect our rights and freedoms as Americans. My dad bought me my first firearm and introduced me to shooting at six years old. <laughs> Six years old. It was a break action barrel, single shot Rossi, 20 gauge, 22 long rifle combo. I've shot four turkeys so far, one at 8, 9, 10, and 11 years old. And I can hardly wait to get back out in the woods with my dad again next month to try and get my fifth. I've also shot three deer so far, a doe. <laughs> this isn't even my kid. <laughs> um, a doe and a spike when I was 10, and a bigger spike last fall when I was 11. Now that I am 12, I will be start, starting trap shooting this summer. It'd be awesome if you could get more money for schools and shooting sports programs. One day, I hope to be able to eventually shoot, a better, uh, shoot better than my dad without him letting me win. <laughs> uh, keep up the good fight. Sincerely, Haley Schilling. Sorry, I get emotional thinking about kids and stuff. Um, Cause it's yeah, what I've grown up with. So yeah. Well, thank you. Thank um, you for being able to make it look pleasant, and that's what our um, that's what the mission of the legacy is for is to um, preserve our outdoor heritage. You know, I'm just the only thing I'm a little concerned about is the you know uh, protecting our freedoms, and that that might not fall under this jurisdiction. Well, but we yeah. the work we all do here yeah. do protect the freedom, not by firearm only, but right. legislation, you know, advocacy, all that are protecting our national freedom. Uh, but hope, 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 hopefully that firearm doesn't get, while we preserve the heritage of culture, uh, of, of outdoor culture, it's not, it's not using firearm to harm another human being. But, but right. um, I'm, this person's still young and so, right. you know, uh, but glad to hear your story as well. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, yeah. and thank you, committee. So, um, with that, we'll lay over Senate File 2534 for possible inclusion in a legacy anonymous bill. Um, thank you both. Thank you. Okay, now I'll leave uh, the rest of the committee member to drill me on my next two bill here. Uh, so I'll pass the gavel to Senator McEwen. Hello, Senator Herr. Um, I understand we're doing Senate File 1027. Senate File 1027, yes. 
Uh, this will be uh, the Humanity Centers. So, um, Mr. Kevin Leslie, if you can join me up here. Um, Madam Chair, members, thank you for the opportunity to, to present um, Senefi, Senefi, um 1027, uh, a bill that will continue to expand the incredible work being done by the Minnesota Humanity Center. The Minnesota Humanity Center collaborated with individual organizations and communities to bring trans transformational humanities programming into the lives of Minnesotans throughout our state. The Minnesota Humanities Center uses stories and the humanities as a catalyst to produce and create and support projects and programs that explore a range of subjects. The work of Minnesota Humanities Center is wide and diverse that includes programming such as Native Nation of Minnesota, Veteran Voices, Veteran Voices Community Connections event, and their work with K-12 educators through professional development opportunity. Uh, Mr. Kevin Lindsay, President and CEO of Minnesota Humanities Center is here to provide an overview of the request uh, from this committee. Welcome to the committee. Mr. Ke Kevin Lindsay. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Hurt, thank you for the introduction of this bill and members of the committee. Um, Accompanying me today is Casey D. Murray. Um, she's going to be advancing slides. I just want to make sure that we are ready from a technology standpoint to do so. Just give us a minute here. Very good. So the building that you're seeing up on the screen now is the last building in the old Children's Gillette Hospital complex. We like to think of this as a place of healing and learning. Uh, we always knock on wood and say that it's the last place that a child with the diagnosis of polio was treated um, medically as well as with education. So we take this very seriously as a place of learning and healing. We also appreciate taking time out to thank you for uh, prior bonding support for the rehabilitation of this building. As mentioned earlier about various uh, work being done to highlight the work of various engineers, this building um, was designed by the architect Cap Wigington, who is one of the most influential uh, black architects in the state of Minnesota. If we go to the next slide. The history of the National Endowment of the Humanities, uh, there's a tie to uh, one of Minnesota's um, most famous and important um, political officials, and that is the Honorable Vice President Hubert Humphrey. The legislation was passed in the late 60s. Minnesota was one of the very first states to raise its hand to say that it would like to uh, enter into an affiliation, a partnership with the National Endowment of the Humanities. Again, we were one of the first eight, and that happened back in 1971. You may have heard the uh, writer, William Faulkner, say, the past is not dead, it's not even past. So for us, connecting the past to the present so we have a better understanding of our current reality uh, helps us spark change and, and find a way forward to the solutions that face us into the future. We seek to convene, connect people into spaces so they can find the solutions on their own terms. We're not coming and providing solutions, but facilitating the opportunities for those solutions to emerge. As Senator Herr mentioned in his earlier comments about creating greater connection and curiosity, our vision is a just society that's curious, connected, and compassionate, curious that we come to conversations with open hearts and open minds so that we can hear authentically one another, that we listen with open hearts so that we're not anticipating what the person is going to say next, that we can really have an honest conversation. Connected, as Dr. King reminds us, that we see ourselves tied to a garment of mutual destiny. What impacts one impacts the other. And motivated beyond 
empathy toward action, and that's where compassion lies. Our request is to enhance the legacy programming funding that we received. We will talk briefly about sort of the work that we do within grants, but today we're really here to talk about the legacy programming uh, dollars that we receive. So we're looking for an ask to $2 million for each year of the respective uh, biennium. We'll uh, go through some of the program areas and I'll highlight some of the areas in which we seek to expand or we'll talk about new programming which we have taken on. But please do keep in mind that we also seek to create connections to uh, funding that exists at the federal level, federal opportunities to bring dollars back into the state of Minnesota. The first is to leverage technology, and you've heard uh, from many of the testifiers today about the change in technology and the ability to deliver uh, an alternative firm, uh, alternative forms and ways of getting information out. So the idea of digital storytelling, podcasts, um, we're seeing more and more of this respective demand. At the very beginning of the pandemic, we started doing more digital storytelling and utilization of alternative means of having people come in in response to the danger and the challenges of the pandemic. We saw substantial growth in our programs, and this, I think, was a benefit to us, and it helped us achieve one of the goals that we have, strategic priority, is getting our programming out to all 87 counties of Minnesota. So we really appreciated um, the opportunity presented to us, and I think we really rose to the occasion, but to continue to rise to the occasion, to continue to make sure that we're delivering our program all throughout the state, we're looking for additional dollars to be able to maximize the use of these alternative forms of technology. Uh, it talks there at the end of creating artificial intelligence programming and events. As many of you are aware of ChatGPT and sort of the challenge that that might mean for us as a society, Within the enabling legislation of the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities, it talks about it's important for us not to become the unthinking servants of technology. Uh, we have been facilitating conversations on artificial intelligence and what this will mean for people going forward. We see this as a huge area for developing programming to have conversations in a wide variety of areas. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, here you'll see a quote from uh, Dr. David Hamler. Many of you know him as the two-star general um, who was also the first African American to rise to that rank in the state of Minnesota, uh, talking about the Vision Trust program that we recently created at the Minnesota Humanities Center. And this is really to highlight and amplify the voices of veterans. Um, we recently had a program with the Ordway on the play A Soldier's Story. We used that as a vehicle to uplift and amplify the various stories of veterans across um, the board, but with particular emphasis on the African American experience. We also had Storytelling Circle in which we had a veteran facilitate a conversation about various mementos, and those various mementos could be uh, letters, it could have been uh, good luck charms, it could be dog tags. And with that, it was an opportunity, again, for us to amplify and leverage the digital storytelling aspect and create a website where we not only heard about the significance of those objects, but we also learned more about where these individuals served and what had changed over the course of time. Um, within this, expanding partnerships with state ethnic councils and cultural organizations um, we're seeing more and more of an opportunity to leverage um, programming that celebrates the many various cultural communities that exist within Minnesota. Um, we, uh, we understand uh, and appreciate that race is a social construct and sometimes we fall into the categories and thinking that there's only five major races, but that's not the way in which the social construct has worked because there's many different languages, many different communities. Um, in both of the metropolitan school districts, uh, more than 80 uh, different languages and dialects are spoken in both St. Paul and Minneapolis. So this idea of being able to amplify, lift up, and celebrate the many different cultural organizations, the many different cultural communities is critically important. We're seeing an increased demand within that space. Immersive cultural experiences. Um, 
we are finding that there is a greater demand for us to create programs in which people can learn about uh, places and spaces in and around where they live, where they go to school, where they work. Uh, this began about 10 years ago with our Bedote field trip. And then within that field trip, individuals had an opportunity to understand from the lens of Dakota people, Fort Snelling, Mounds Park, uh, Pilot Knob Road, what that would then mean uh, from a historical lens from the Dakota perspective. These learning experiences have now uh, grown into other areas and we're seeing more and more of demand for other cities to ask and come and create their Badote type uh, of programming. Lastly, um, the opportunities in, in diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, one of the testifiers earlier today was the Science Museum. We have partnered with them in this space. Um, the St. Paul Chamber has also asked us to coordinate four out of their six uh, immersive experiences this upcoming business cycle year for them. Um, I want to really highlight here that in this space, the idea of finding positive understanding of various communities and being able to find solutions and working together as groups, the stories that we find and the stories that we tell are really moving the diversity and equity conversation to more of a collaborative, positive approach. And we find that this is, um, again, a great demand for the respective work. Um, being able to understand that the contributions have occurred across uh, many different communities is critically important. If we go to the next slide. Um, the space and lifelong learning, again, um, we all understand that as we become more and more um, a learning, uh, information-driven society, the ability to understand and access information becomes even more critically important. Um, we are providing more opportunities, not just within the traditional K through 12 uh, educational system, not just simply within uh, the college setting, but literally from uh, cradle to a grave, uh, opportunities for people to become more understanding, more conversant in a wide variety of different areas. Um, one of the things that we're very proud of within this space, we brought books here. There's uh, one of the books there's up on the screen. I think the one on the screen is Ella Cora de la Deloria, uh, Language Learner. Uh, we have one on our Lieutenant Governor, Peggy Flanagan. And then for the baseball fans in the house, Charles Bender, who is the first Minnesotan and also uh, indigenous person to be elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame. When I had a chance to go across the state and speak uh, with Justice Page, he also is a big trod too, uh, has a book about his dangling pinky. Um, these stories were well received, but it allowed us to balance out the various curriculum and various stories that are told within elementary schools throughout. This program really grew out of an opportunity for us to be in partnership with a writer from the indigenous community. We would find uh, no shortage of authors to work with us to uh, diversify the early reading materials that students all across the state are looking to see. And again, these stories provide examples of success. I really appreciated the comment that was made earlier um, by one of the testifiers is that when people see themselves, they're more interested. This was from the individual testifying on behalf of the library. When those stories, people see themselves within those stories, they tend to come back. When people see a uh, history of success from folks that look like them, they aspire to do more and to go on and do greater things. Um, the building that we saw in the very first slide, just wanted to highlight, again, an increased demand for teacher and paraprofessional professional development. Um, as many of you know, um, there is a teacher shortage. One of the ways to counteract that teacher shortage is to increase opportunities for folks that enter in as paraprofessionals to matriculate as teachers. The last two years, more school districts have been asking us to specifically have uh, opportunities for professional development for paraprofessionals. So we have done multi-day summer institutes at the Minnesota Humanities Center. Uh, we see this as a great opportunity to be a win-win for the entire state. Um, we continue and have always done teacher professional development, but I would say because of the shortage, again, not as much time for master teachers to provide additional teaching support within schools 
is that those schools are seeing us as a stopgap to help them in doing more for professional development for teachers. If we go to the next slide. Um, we've had an opportunity to expand and, and do more work in the area of civics, not just within Minnesota, but across uh, the country. Uh, a specific program showing this tie to national and local is the third way civics. Uh, there are no red, there are no blue schools, but within this uh, grant program, we identified a way in which to talk about civics and government in a non-polarizing way, and it's called third way civics. So in partnership with our friends at Ball State in Indiana and Redland College in Florida, and six colleges here in Minnesota, we have been expanding um, third way civics for education colleges. And we feel like this is going to have a, um, a, an effect, not just in college, but also in high school, and also the way in which teachers approach being able to find solutions, again, with NK-12 schools. The collaborations with Native Nations. Um, many of you know about our We Are Water exhibit that has been going on. The idea of telling the great work of being able to uh, find success and being able to grow wild rice in certain areas of the state where we've struggled to do so because of pollution. Incorporating those stories of good water stewardship and great ideas as it relates to uh, dealing with pollution we're incorporating those ideas into our We Are Water work. And again, the civic education materials for schools. If we go to the next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. The last thing that I'll say is about grant making. And again, this is uh, different than the request that's before you today, because we're really just talking about programming. But I do think it's important uh, for you to understand sort of the totality of sort of what we do to spend just a little time. Um, in the ecosystem of grant making, the Minnesota Humanities Center plays a role, I would say, to support smaller cultural organizations within the state of Minnesota. So you'll see that top line, about 73% of our funding through the various cultural heritage grants went to organizations with annual budgets less than $500,000. That really requires us to be very intentional in doing outreach to these respective communities, also providing them with training and, and ways in which to learn about applying for grants. And then in the servicing of grants, uh, Senator Green had asked a question about making sure then no money is cheats back to the state or comes back to the state. So we do periodic check-ins with organizations to make sure that they are on track to be able to perform under their cultural heritage grant. And we take great pride in making sure that all those grantees are able to perform um, under their grant agreement. <clears throat> the process is very open. Um, we provide opportunities in the pre-application process for people to find out more information about how to go about submitting a successful grant. Um, our review, very similar to what was stated by the historical society, is to use independent review panels. Uh, the independent review panels are, are individuals who have an opportunity from the various communities. Um, and then uh, the monitoring and reporting that we do uh, as well um, at the end. The grants are really reflective of the entirety of the state. And again, we take great pride in having 30% of all grant applications being awarded outside the seven county metro. As many of you know, the population in Minnesota, about 70% of the population in Minnesota is in the seven county metro, and 30% is outside of the seven county metro. So we're very intentional uh, in that. I'll stop here to see if there's any questions. Thank you for your testimony and your presentation. Members, um, yes, any questions, Senator Green? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, two questions. Uh, the first one is one I've been trying to get at uh, with, with the asks, mm -hmm. and so it's probably for almost everybody, but what is the increase that you're asking for compared to what you did in previous years? 
sir, our senator or our testifier? Sure. Senator, senator Green, Madam, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, it was $1.25 per year in the prior biennium, and we're now asking to move up to $2 million. So it would be 750000 more each year. Okay. Senator Green, follow-up? Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Then the other question is, I know you guys do a lot outside the state. Mm -hmm. Do you have good policies in place to make sure that the grants that you're, that you're giving out are kept inside Minnesota? So uh, we receive money from the National Endowment from the Humanities. So there are requirements that we have to comply with it under federal law. Um, there's money that we receive from Legacy, and then there's money that we receive from uh, very sizable foundations. Um, and so, in some years, the foundation's money is actually more money than we get from the state of Minnesota. But those are dedicated for the specific work that that foundation has provided us a grant for. So we're very fortunate to have a top-notch uh, chief financial officer to make sure that those funds are properly segregated, and then a report is given to me on a very regular basis as to how well we're performing under those respective grants. And then the board of the Minnesota Humanities Center, uh, when I was hired about four years ago, also wanted to make sure that we held ourselves to the highest standard. Uh, so organizational excellence is one of our priorities. I mention that because sometimes organizations just view success as just the completion of the project. But we uh, went further, brought in utilization-focused evaluation to evaluate our programs. So how program recipients are and program participants are seeing the value add within the program. So sometimes people are seeing an increased value in how they're seeing change come about within their organization. And that can look very differently for the, the populations. So for us, yes, it's segregated. It's very clear as to how the money is spent. We have no questions as to uh, the appropriateness of how money is spent. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any further discussion or questions? For Senate File 1027. All right, seeing none, uh, thank you very much for the presentation today. Senator Hur, do you have any final thoughts before we lay the bill over? Uh, I'd just like to ask that this bill be laid over for possible inclusion. Very thank good. You. We will do that. The bill is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Hur. <laughs> Thank you, members of the committee. And next on our agenda, Senator Her, Senator Her, we have Senate File 1682. Is that what you have? Yes. Yes, sir. Very good. Uh, mem Madam Chair um, and members, uh, in front of us is Senate File 1682. Uh, this bill contains the governor's spending recommendation for the Clean Water Fund, the Park and the Parks and Trail Funds and the Arts and Culture Heritage Fund for uh, fiscal year 2024 to 2025. The recommendation are for 315 million in the bill, but there are three million. There is three million more in the f in the fund after the February forecast, which we rec recommend to be for the Agriculture Best Management Practice Loan Fund. So with me here is Par Gardner, um, administrator for the Clean Water Council, will be speaking further about the legislation. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Gardner. Uh, we look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, Chair Her, uh, I think I maybe was presumptuous in coming to the table among the uh, potential recipients of the legacy bill, but uh, we'll get started. <laughs> Uh, with the Clean Water Fund. Uh, uh, Madam Chair and members, my name is Paul Gardner. I'm the administrator of the Clean Water Council, a state advisory council set up in statute in 2006. And uh, one of its statutory roles is to uh, recommend how to spend the Clean Water Fund, which is one third of the revenue from the Clean Water Land and Legacy Amendment. I'm joined here by two of our citizen appointees, uh, John Barton, our chair, and Jen Cater, our vice chair, who uh, were happy to back me up at uh, they're right there. We also have several agency members of the Clean Water Council behind me and other agency staff who may be able to answer any technical questions you might have. Uh, Madam Chair and members, uh, Senate File 1682 includes the Clean Water Council's and the Governor's recommendations for the Clean Water Fund for fiscal 24 and 25. They are identical. Uh, that has been by design for the last couple of uh, budget cycles. Uh, the material you have is for $315 million uh, because of the February forecast, we now have 
3.098 extra uh, million dollars, uh, which uh, the council has recommended be put into one program, which I've informed staff about. Uh, you have a couple of handouts. One is a breakdown by agency of the spending, which mirrors the format you have in the, the bill. The other is a breakdown from our recommendations report, an excerpt which breaks down the spending by function. So it's a handy cross-reference, but the money adds up to be the same. Uh, I would like to just mention quickly that the Clean Water Council has uh, 28 members. Uh, 17 of them are voting members uh, who are appointed by the governor. Uh, the uh, uh, other uh, members include uh, the University of Minnesota, state agencies, and uh, four legislators, including uh, the chair, Senator McEwen. Let's see. Um, the uh, question we get the most from the legislature, which uh, we've now consolidated to a 30-second uh, presentation, <laughs> is how all the pieces in the Clean Water Fund fit together. Uh, because we have a lot of line items, they're listed by agency, and some of them use the same names, and so people have said, how does this all fit together? So the basic idea for surface waters and to some degree drinking water is this. We test our waters everywhere in the state to figure out if there's something wrong with our water. If there isn't something wrong, we try and protect it with a particular set of strategies to maintain healthy water. If there is something wrong with our water, uh, we want to help restore those waters to meet water quality standards. And we do that by figuring out what the source of the problem is, coming up with a plan to fix the problem, funding the fix, and then measuring to see if the fix worked. That process can take a decade to 15 years before we identify an impairment in our waters and the time that we might, if possible, uh, take it off the impaired waters list. It re relies on a lot of science, a lot of good planning, a lot of stakeholder engagement at the local level, uh, and some patience. I just wanted to show you um, uh, more pictures and words here. This is an example of how we use that watershed-based uh, approach, and that is, um, uh, this is the Yellow Medicine Watershed in southwestern Minnesota. Mm -hmm. The Minnesota River runs from northwest to southeast. The red lines are impaired streams. The red dots are impaired lakes. Uh, PCA staff helped me put this uh, map together. It shows the impairments for those waters. These are fairly typical for a uh, county in southern Minnesota with a lot of agriculture. Uh, bacteria, nutrients, uh, sediment-related things, and the like. Uh, I did want to mention the timeline here, though. The first monitoring to determine these impairments was in 2010. The full monitoring and assessment process was finished by 2013. And the data that that provides us lets us put together plans or strategies. So we have these documents for every watershed in the state, or we'll soon have one that says, if we do a certain number of projects at a certain scale, we should get the desired uh, pollutant reductions uh, to get to quality qual water quality standards, and we have a pretty good idea what the cost will be. That is very powerful information to have for decision making. The bad news is we know the price tag for all watersheds, uh, as well as our drinking water efforts, uh, exceeds that uh, available from the Clean Water Fund, as generous as that is. So other things need to happen to get us to where we want to be. Uh, but in terms of spending the Clean Water Fund, once we have that uh, targeted information, then we spend money in a targeted way to try and address those impairments. So we have an example of some best practices in this heavily agricultural area. Everything from uh, septic system um, improvements to uh, one of my favorite acronyms, a WASCOB, a water and sediment control basin. It operates a lot like a rain garden here in the cities. Uh, those, uh, we have made uh, three successive grants from the Board of Water and Soil Resources to target those issues over th um, using the Clean Water Fund. In 2021, there was a second uh, monitoring cycle where we do kind of a complete physical of the watershed again, and the report hasn't been back out yet. But we would have an idea after we try and fund these fixes to see if uh, they worked or not. And then we're able to take some of those waters off the impaired waters list if it worked. So uh, that's the basic gist. We use a similar logical process for drinking water. Um, uh, we appreciate your attention. Uh, we appreciate the uh, generosity of the voters in 2008 who voted for the, the amendment during the worst uh, um, recession since World War II to raise their taxes to support a variety of things, including clean water. I uh, appreciate the leadership of uh, Senator Cohen, who's here, and uh, Speaker Kelleher, who I served with as a House member back then. And, uh, we're just glad to have those resources to be able to do this over a 25-year period. 
Uh, that is our Reader's Digest uh, version of the uh, Clean Water Fund and how it works, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony and presentation today. Um, next on our list of uh, presenters. Um, sure. Um, I'll, I'll defer to our lead author, Senator Herr. Senator Herr, would you like to wait with questions for the end or go testifier by testifier? We can do that. We're almost done, so we could um, you know, slow our pace a little bit for testifier per testifier. Testifier by testifier. Okay, after, after you, Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, I, and I'm not going to belabor things. I, I know that everybody wants to get out of here, but uh, there are, I do have some questions. First of all, I have a request for your testifier. I would like every one of those charts. I used to get them in the house, and then that was before COVID. And, uh, and then after that, it got to be tougher and tougher to get them, and I haven't gotten back in the, in the groove of that yet. So if I could get uh, a list of those charts, I'd really appreciate that. I, I know that uh, you're, uh, when you talk about your, uh, the money that's given, and <clears throat> I will, first of all, give you kind of a pat on the back because all of the, out of all the legacy funds out there, I think clean water is, is probably what, uh, what the people voted for. And I think the Clean Water Council probably does the best job of all the agencies uh, in, this, in this aspect. However, I, do, I did go through this, and out of the, out of the money that's been appropriated to the clean water portion, uh, it looks like only about a third of it maybe is going into projects. And it seems to be that more and more we see things going into uh, more tests here, more tests there, logging of uh, different uh, information. A lot of money's going to the U to do more, more and more experiments. But I, you know, the projects that you guys have done I think you're seeing some pretty good results, and I'd really like to see more money going into those projects. So, and I just went through this quick, so can you give me a breakdown of, and you don't have to do it now if you don't have it in front of you. It's up here. Okay, a, break, <laughs> a breakdown of, of uh, the amount of money that's gone into to specific boots on the ground projects. Very good. Mr. Gardner. And Madam Chair, uh, and congratulations, uh, Senator Green, on your promotion, by the way, from the other body. Uh, and uh, thank you for your kind words, although I knew there would be a however. Uh, we spend about 14% pretty consistently uh, on all of the monitoring characterization and assessments. So that is the science. The thing is in the, in the bill and in the number breakdown, the number of programs looks probably like we spend more on it than we do. So we have kind of fewer big programs that spend a lot of money on projects and a lot of little programs on specific things like fish assessments and water chemistry and geologic atlases. So we're spending around 14% for the monitoring characterization and assessment. We do spend a little bit more on the, the, the planning part so that we have engagement by local stakeholders to identify which things we fund first. But I'd say roughly 75% uh, of the dollars are spent on projects and they go for uh, mostly to Bowser. Bowser gets about, uh, the Board of Water and Soil Resources gets about half the revenue from the Clean Water Fund. For specific uh, projects, we also support a little bit for the uh, Public Facilities Authority for wastewater treatment and uh, uh, small wastewater treatment grants. And then uh, we spend another slice of that implementation funding, as we call it, for drinking water source protection through the health department. So if you add those three slices together, uh, there is a pie chart, and I don't think I included it in your handout, but it adds up to about 75%. Follow up, Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for that information. I'd like to. I'd like to see that. I, I do. Uh, I do question um, uh, the money that goes into Bowser would be all put into projects. I did look through some of the stuff that they're doing, and a lot of what Bowser does is not into projects. There's also some uh, land purchases, but I'm only going to ask one more question, and then we can move on. And that is, you know, you mentioned the wastewater treatment plants, which. Uh, is pretty much known now that that is one of our biggest sources of pollution in our water. And I do know that in, uh, in the LCCMR bill now, there's, there's a um, language in there that actually prevents LCCMR money from going into those plants. But in here, and I won't look it up because I'll spend my time paging, but I'm pretty sure it's only like $200,000 that's out of this money that's going into, uh, specifically going into uh, small wastewater treatment facilities. 
And uh, is am I right on that? I hope I'm not, but Madam Chair. Yes, after you, Mr. Gregory. <laughs> Madam Sorry. Chair and uh, Senator Green. So there are there are two elements related to wastewater in the uh, well, the three really. One is on uh, septic systems through the PCA, so we've had higher inspections and compliance because of that. Another is uh, the point source implementation grant program, which goes to the Public Facilities Authority. I want to say we're at about 18 million, something like that. Uh, that is one of uh, two sources, at least, for that program to help existing wastewater treatment plants upgrade just enough to meet water quality effluent standards. It doesn't mean that it's a fund to replace the entire plant. Then there is a small amount, and I think it is in the hundreds of thousands, for um, uh, small community wastewater programs. Uh, these, we spent more money uh, in the early days of the Clean Water Fund with that through the Public Facilities Authority. There are several dozen communities literally that are unincorporated and it's a few dozen households or businesses that maybe had a straight pipe or a, um, a diff, uh, or they're under sewered or unsewered communities where the Public Facilities Authority was able to give a grant to those communities to get the planning going so they could figure out what their next step is, which could be bonding. Um, we haven't had more demand for that program at the moment. If we did, that number would be higher. Um, I'm sure Mr. Uh, Freeman, who's here, could get you more details if you'd like. But we always get that question. It seems like the number's low, but we've, we've hit all of the folks who are in the most dire need, and we're ready to meet demand as it comes. Senator Green. Just a comment, then. Uh, Bonding? Cash. Thank you, Senator Green. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a comment, then. I do know of, of other uh, small communities out there that could really use uh, some help with their wastewater, and I think that if we're going to if we're going to work on a bill that uh, and an amendment that was based on clean water legacy, then we should be putting in the clean water. So maybe I'll get out there and encourage them to start applying. But you're a very knowledgeable man. Thank you for the information. Well, thank you, Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. Senator Herr. Well, thank you, <coughs> thank you uh, for uh, Mr. Gardner for coming to testify. Um, that's good. That's good. We're good. Yep. And you know, this is. Um, one of the bill that you know what got governor recommendation as well. So we, uh, I like to ask that we. Uh, Senator, her, you have uh, Parks and Trail coming up next. Is oh, that Park correct? That I believe. They, okay, I, I I didn't have the agenda with me back here. No, they're going to go last. So you got State Arts Board. You got Senator Cohen. Is that what you want me to do next? Yes. Thank you. But maybe after we uh, lay this over for possible inclusion. Yep. I'll get back up there and we'll hear Senator Cohen. Thank you. I thought you were still doing your thing, so that's fine. I just am letting Senator McEwen, she has a couple bills up that she got to go, uh, okay. got to go listen to me. She, has to, she had to go, and so I, I'm helping out here. So thank you. So uh, with that, Senator uh, Fong, her, you want to lay this bill over for possible inclusion into your omnibus bill. All right. Yes. Thank you, Senator. Thank All you. right. You want? <laughs> I love that. So you want to? Yeah, I love it. Greeny, Greeny can count. Look at this. It's two and two. What? Do you, what happens then? Right? It's like. <laughs> the twice now. You, you get to the bond. My apologies, Jai, to Parks and Trail. Uh, I think uh, you're, you're here too. This is what I'll be under the Senate file 16, 1682. I, I didn't have the agenda with me when I was testifying um, in support of Senate file 1682 uh, and also Minnesota State Art Board. You, you're still here, right? I, I was turning toward this way, so I didn't see all members. My apology. Uh, perhaps I, I can just conduct it from here, and I, I just call forth uh, um, Minnesota's Art Board, um, Sue Jin, and uh, uh, Senator Dick Cohen, Cohen, just come come up here and speak in support of uh, Senate File um, 1682, and uh, 
Senator Hoffman, thank you for taking the gavel, but we'll, we'll, we'll include that after. We'll, we'll motion again, you know, when the, we done with the test file from Minnesota Arts Board and State uh, Park Central. So welcome, Senator Cohen. And this will be to speak in support of the uh, Clean Water Council and Park Control and Cultural Heritage Fund. Um, and you, later on, we'll reserve a little section where you can talk about the history of the legacy of this committee. Yeah. So, Senator Cohen, you want to start, or Ms. Su Jen, you want to start? <coughs> well, Whoever, say your name for the record. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm uh, Richard Cohen, and uh, speaking today as a member of the Minnesota State Arts Board, having been appointed by Governor Walls to the Arts Board in uh, August of 2021. Uh, Mr. Okay. Chair, as to what you would like to do, I noticed you talked to Ms. Josephson. Uh, uh, you, you may proceed. Okay. Well, Mr. Chair, you indicated you wanted to have some discussion. I talked to both yourself and, and to uh, uh, Ms. Josephson about uh, a few minutes about the history of the Legacy Amendment, which was going to segue into the discussion with the Arts Board. What, would you allow that? Wait, prefer to wait on that? or? Yeah, go, go ahead. Okay. Yep. What? All right, so, so let me just offer a perspective to members relative to uh, the history of, of the Legacy Amendment, where it started. Uh, members might be aware, probably are aware, that uh, it initiated with uh, Senator Bob Lassard from International Falls in, I believe, 1999, 24 years ago, where Senator Lassard had a proposal for what has now become the Lassard Sams Commission relative to habitat preservation. And uh, uh, at that time, the proposal was based upon a Missouri amendment, which uh, provided general fund dollars constitutionally dedicated to habitat preservation. That segued, and it was, it was uh, tremendous to hear from uh, Mr. Gardner relative to the Clean Water Council, it segued into members of uh, uh, the conservation community who had an interest in, in uh, clean water. And just parenthetically, Mr. Chair, members, when I chaired uh, the Finance Committee, uh, prior to the Legacy Amendment, chaired the State Government Finance Division, it was always a great success when we could provide an additional $10, $15 million a year for clean water. So obviously uh, uh, a figurative drop in the bucket for what was needed. Um, simultaneously with that, uh, when I began chairing the State Government Finance Division, which was 30 years ago, um, I asked uh, then Majority Leader Roger Moe if I could have jurisdiction over all of the uh, cultural uh, uh, agencies and, and accounts. And he said that I could. Uh, later on, uh, Senator Mo suggested he had created some kind of a Frankenstein monster when he gave me jurisdiction of all that. Um, but at the time, I was looking for trying to, to augment uh, the, the cultural life in, in the state of Minnesota. Uh, and, and at that time, state government was about four times what it is now in terms of accounts, so I had a lot more room within the division. But it was also very clear that when I became chair of the Senate Finance Committee, uh, and I, sh I should mention that there was some interest in the Senate in the Legacy Amendment, uh, coupled with some of the work I was doing separate from that. But it was clear when you looked at, uh, when, I, when I began chairing the, the Finance Committee in 2003, and I looked at the budget drivers, K-12, human services, and so on, the other parts of Minnesota life were going to get nothing but scraps, absent something else. And that's when the interest became very serious in the Senate Finance Committee. It was that at that time I also created uh, Article 4 of, uh, of the Legacy Amendment. And we put together over those next three or four years, there were basically four of us, uh, Senator Dallas Sams was uh, the original author of the Constitutional Amendment, and uh, members uh, who didn't have a chance to know Senator Sams did spectacular work. Uh, sadly, Senator Sams got ill uh, he did not come back for the 2007 session. He passed away in March of 2007. Um, but in addition to Senator Sams and myself, Senator Larry Pogamiller, who was then chair of the Senate Tax Committee, later Senate Majority Leader, and my partner on the Finance Committee, Senator Denny Fredrickson, who was the senior Republican in the Senate and the senior member of the Finance Committee, a very unique member of the state Senate for many years, uh, was a Vietnam-era uh, Navy fighter pilot and... Uh, uh, a farmer out of the New Ulm area. He's now been succeeded by Senator Dames. And the group of us took a look at all this, realized that when you looked at some of these very, 
I enjoyed listening to Senator Kunish at the outset because in the original legacy bill in 2009, we had the first appropriation for the preservation of the Ojibwe and Lakota languages, and I believe it was the first such effort anywhere in the United States. Um, and obviously members are aware to some extent of what happened uh, during those first few years uh, where we put together the ability in the Senate to pass the bill, the Senate Finance Committee to begin with, and then in the Senate to pass the bill. It was absolutely a, a, a bipartisan effort. Uh, there were approximately 75% to 80% of each caucus in support of the bill, approximately 20% or so of, of each caucus in opposition to the legacy amendment. Uh, it was passed finally in uh, 2007 initially, and then in 2008 finally. Uh, I will suggest that uh, the impetus came from the Senate, that uh, there were some members of the House who were very interested. Mr. Gardner mentioned, for instance, not only himself, but uh, 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 Margaret Kelleher, Mike Sharon, Ron Abrams. Um, but there wasn't a real consensus in the, in the House until the Senate took action. And then, of course, it led to the um, passage on, on the ballot in 2008. Um, in all honesty, I was not particularly involved with that. I was kind of advisory to the campaign. Um, I think, Mr. Chair, you, you're aware that uh, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in 2007, 2008, my principal political effort was I was involved nationally with President Obama's campaign. And so I was involved with the legacy amendment, but, but in an advisory way. Um, and that brings us, I don't know, about to the present date. But, but that was what was precedent. One of the things that I think important uh, for what's happened is, as, as I've listened to the presentations, as all of you have listened to the presentations, and you've heard about um, the competitive grants programs, for instance, whether it be through the Humanities Commission, through the uh, Historical Society, the work done by the Clean Water Council, uh, you'll hear about the work done by the Arts Board, that that has brought national attention to the state of Minnesota. Over the years, I, I think I've spoken at, in, I believe, about 15 individual states, have also spoken nationally, although principally my, my national uh, discussions have, have been relative to the arts. My last uh, state visit was in Wisconsin to speak to the annual meeting of the, of the Wisconsin Conservation Officers about the Legacy Amendment. Um, at the time it passed, I believe it was, and some of the folks here could correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was the largest, the single largest um, environment and cultural state or local initiative in the history of the United States. And uh, I think that's continued to the present date. And uh, we've been able to do, with the help of this committee, with past legislatures, some very significant work. Let me, if I might, offer a couple of thoughts, and, and then you can hear from Ms. Jens in terms of where the Arts Board is presently. Um, Ms. Josephson, in particular, Mr. Chairman, had asked me to comment on you know, the question of, uh, and this is more directly relative to the arts part of it, uh, the question of competitive grants and earmarks. Um, I might also add, uh, you've got a very strange number, which is 47% for the arts board. And that's a consequence that uh, when we began this in 2009, when I first chaired the Legacy Subcommittee, which was then a subcommittee of the Finance Committee, um, the intent was, and the, and the promise to folks in Minnesota in passage of the amendment, I think Senator Green mentioned Mr. Chairman, that, that uh, clean water was clearly the driving political force in passage of the amendment. Uh, but all parts of, of, uh, of, of those involved with the amendment played a very significant role, and I can comment on that in, in a minute. Um, but certainly the promise within Article 4, that given the fact that at the time there were about 1,300 arts organizations, now maybe 1,400, 1,450, including both uh, organizations uh, supported by the Arts Board as well as organizations supported by the regional arts councils, that 50% uh, of the money would go to the state arts board and the regional arts councils. And in you know the, uh, the conference committee games that are played, if I might use that phrase, um, the House never came anywhere close to that. Mm -hmm. And so I would always have in, in the bill uh, the 50%. And in 2013, then Speaker Thiessen um, in the last weekend came into my office and said, okay, um, we'll do 47%. And uh, uh, I was willing to say, okay, fine, let's just call it quits. And that's how you've ended up with that fair, very strange number of 47%. Um, 
more directly Senator relative. Senator Cohen, I'm is so it, sorry to interrupt you. This is such an interesting history. Really appreciate hearing the background of this. I just wanted to um, just take uh, a note for all of us in the room. Be, we have a, a very hard stop at 1250. Oh, uh, and um, so that leaves us just 15 minutes left for our all of the rest of the speakers. I'm, so I don't mean to, perhaps if there's um, a way to just sort of move toward wrapping was, up, that would be I wonderful. Just, uh, and Mr. Chair, Senator McCune, I, I apologize. Yeah. I didn't realize that there was a Not a at all. It, no, we apologize. We just, we're trying to fit in so much right now. So thank you, I, Senator. Mr. Chairman, I can only mention it's really too bad you didn't have a chance to serve on the Finance Committee with Senator Miriam many years ago. We'd sit there until Saturday night at 8 o'clock, and we'd uh, try to see what we could do to quit. So let me just, I just wanted to make one other, my one other comment is relative to this question of earmarks versus competitive grants. And um, I'll just suggest that uh, when, you, when you have earmarking, you'll end up with many losers. For instance, uh, just one example, Group 2 within the State Arts Board has about $5 million. So if you have a $2 million earmark, you'll then diminish everybody else's grant by 40%. The same would be true at a level with uh, the regional arts councils as well. And that's why I would suggest when you take a look at uh, how to handle it, um, certainly you're the legislature, you can do what you want, but there'll be losers and winners. And, and, and my fear would be that the losers, let me give you one major example, the, the losers would be smaller organizations, greater Minnesota organizations, and the best comparison is what happened, in my final comment, is what, what happened in the state of Colorado. Colorado started doing earmarking. This was a number of years ago. For instance, the Colorado Symphony, at the Colorado State, it's a little bit bigger than Minnesota. Um, the Colorado Symphony uh, hired somebody and they got something like $4 million, and that continued and continued, and what happened is there was so much uh, animosities that, that developed within the Colorado arts community, they got tired of the whole thing. Uh, the legislature got tired of, whole, of the whole thing. And the state of Colorado now appropriates $2 million a year for the arts. And, and my fear would be that when you start developing some of, those, some of that, you'll find the same thing happening in, in uh, Minnesota. We've already had a little bit of a taste of that. So I just want to offer that cautionary note and appreciating the schedule, Sir McEwen, I'm sorry I did not know that. Uh, let me ask uh, if, if you'll be able to uh, listen for a couple of minutes to uh, Director Jens as to what's going on with the State Arts Board and obviously the folks from Parks and Trails, which are a very huge part of this. Very good. Thank you very much, Senator Cohen. And Senator Hur, would you like to yes. um, have a few words before we go to sure. um, Director uh, Jens? Sure. And, and uh, my apology for the confusion. Um, you know, I had my back turned and didn't have the agenda with me, so... It's still, my, it's still, we're still under the bill of Senate file 1682. Correct. And so, since I'm over here, I just decide that I just be over here and <laughs> continue with um, with Senator McCune as chair. The, in a in a in a, in a split of a minute within a minute or so, there there was a little confusion. She has to go and all that, and yes. Chin Gavel. So now yes. I just want to make it so that we we stay informal that. I'm still presenting the bill with, with the testifier, and Senator McEwen is the chair of this committee at the moment, so, but I'm Very sitting good. over here. So, thank you, yep. thank you, Senator Her. That's correct, I, I thought that I was needed in another committee briefly, but it sounds like they're not ready for me yet. So I'm back and filling the role of temporarily of chair for Senator Her while he continues the presentation of this bill, just so everybody is clear. Um, um, Director Jens, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Uh, my name is Sue Jens. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota State Arts Board. In, uh, in view of your hard stop, um, I'm going to just abbreviate very quickly a few things. I hope you got a handout that I brought along or you have it online, and, and I don't have my slides numbered, but I'm going to pick out a couple of them just to highlight for you today. Uh, Minnesota has been investing in the arts uh, through a, a public agency for more than 100 years. In 1903, this first State Arts Society was created in state government, and that work has been continuing for, obviously, decades. Um, we are established in Minnesota Statutes, Chapter 129D outlines our responsibilities, our structure, and all of the things we do. There are two things that are primary. Uh, one is we provide financial support. So the dollars that come from the legislature 
we appropriate those back out or not appropriate, we grant them out through statewide grant programs. The other thing we do is to serve as the fiscal agent for 11 regional arts councils. That's a structure that was created by the legislature in the 1970s to ensure that there would be funding for uh, not just large organizations, not just large cities, but also rural areas, small towns, and every county. We as a system provide grants in every single county in Minnesota. Um, and we're very proud of that. The, um, uh, I want to speed ahead. Uh, so I've given you some examples in your materials about the kinds of grant programs we have offered. Uh, we do receive general fund dollars and legacy dollars, but legacy clearly is the largest portion of uh, our funding. Uh, there is a slide that might be number six or number seven in your handout. It's applications and grants. As a system, in the last biennium, we reviewed more than 7,000 grant applications. We made more than 5,000 grants. And uh, picking up on something uh, Senator Cohen said just a moment ago, it wouldn't be possible for you to uh, hear 7,000 grantees here in your committee uh, or meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. So we hope that that's a service that we are providing for you uh, and doing that work. We use more than 300 individuals who help review all of the applications. They discuss them in an open public meeting. They score them, and that's how we decide what to fund. You have on the next slide in your packet uh, our state appropriations, both general fund and legacy appropriations. And I just wanted to highlight that the governor in his bill and in, in uh, Chair Her's bill uh, is requesting $90,795,000 for the Arts Board for the 24-25 biennium, and that is consistent with the 47% that is in state statute. So that's the governor's recommendation, and we fully support that. The last number I will leave you with, and then I will end there, is that in the 2020-21 uh, biennium, even in the height of COVID when it was hard for people to gather, the programs at the Arts Board and Regional Arts Councils together served more than 19 million people. As a system, we are big, we are broad, and we are reaching out. And those programs uh, pr uh, underscored the cultural traditions of the state, they brought people together, uh, they inspired our creativity. And so on behalf of those 19 million people, thank you for the past support, and we do hope you'll support the governor's recommendation and chair her's bill. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Senator Cohen, did you have something as well? Ma Madam Chair, just very quickly, one, one other thing I wanted to mention. This committee is going to have an important responsibility in the next few years, and that's going to be the reauthorization of the amendment. And it's possible within the legislature that I don't expect there to be 100% support, but... Uh, whether it's done in two, 2032, which would be the latest date, or there's an argument to do it in 2028, which isn't that far away. All the folks in this room behind me were all involved with that passage. And I'll just tell you that I happen to think, having been involved, a lot of folks in this state, and a lot of folks in the legislature, believe that the reauthorization is a fait accompli. I don't believe that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take the same kind of effort and, and to maintain the unity that we had in 2006, 2007, and 2008 that allowed passage. So just want to leave that admonition with you. Thank you, Senator Cohen. Um, next we have um, some people to testify from par for Parks and Trails. Oh, okay, very good. We have one remote testifier and two people here in person, Andrew Korsberg, uh, Lisa Beth Barajas, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. <laughs> you can introduce yourself for the record. And then we also have Renee Matson online. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, I am Lisa, Bar uh, Lisa Barajas. I'm the Executive Director of the Metropolitan Council uh, of the Community Development Division at the Council. And we'll try to keep our remarks uh, brief. And I will likely speak too quickly. So I'll try to not do that. But I am joined today by my two colleagues, Renee Matson online and Andrew Korsborg. I'm Renee Matson with the Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails Commission and Andrew with uh, the Minnesota DNR's Parks and Trails Division. It's really important that the three of us uh, agencies together are partners in this work and is why we uh, are presenting together in this. So I'll just give you a brief overview of the fund itself. As you know, this is one of four legacy funds. Parks and Trails um, is in particular uh, focused on uh, parks and trails of regional or statewide significance. 
And that includes the, the parts of the system that each of our three agencies are responsible for overseeing and, and implementing. Next slide, please. So Minnesota's 25-year Parks and Trails Legacy Plan guides the overall priorities for the fund. This plan was developed with extensive public engagement across the state, including thousands of youth and diverse participants. And it guides all three of us partner agencies um, in our work and provides a consistent vision across the entire state of Minnesota, which is to provide a seamless, accessible, and welcoming system of parks and trails for all Minnesotans. So these, this legacy fund truly is a game changer for this entire system. And the funds allow partners to accelerate our work in critical areas and fill important gaps. There are four pillars that you can see on the slide here that really orient all of the spending that we have um, within the legacy fund across this entire system. Connecting people in the outdoors, acquiring land and creating opportunities, taking care of what we have, and coordinating among partners. So I'll turn briefly to the Metropolitan Regional Park System. And on behalf of the council and our 10 regional parks implementing agencies, um, I'm really pleased to, to uh, represent uh, the regional system and our efforts. On this slide, you can see uh, the 10 uh, regional parks implementing agencies, which are directed by statute, who those agencies are in the, in the uh, seven county metro area. And while it is hard to read, the green lines and green um, polygons on this map represent the regional system, which is made up of over, of, um, sorry, 56 regional parks and park reserves, eight special recreation features, and 55 regional trails with well over 415 miles of riding, rolling, and walking opportunities. In total, the Metropolitan Regional Park System is almost 55,000 acres of parkland that's open to all Minnesotans. In the regional system, legacy funds are distributed by a statutorily derived formula. 90% of those funds, um, the council distributes directly to the 10 regional parks implementing agencies, and the formula for that distribution is also in law. The remaining 10% provides funding for land acquisition, and for each acquisition, agencies contribute 25% of the acquisition cost, and the council contributes 30% of the cost. The remaining 45% of the cost comes from the legacy fund. The, parks, uh, the council's park acquisition opportunity fund, which makes up all of those sources, um, has a very strong demand, and we continue to uh, build out our system um, with this particular fund being an important part of that. This slide is a detailed breakdown that represents the formula. We did update it recently based on the forecast, uh, but really just a summary, this may not, this, um, the numbers and distribution are subject to change based on the updated inputs that come, that are required by state law for that formula distribution. But more importantly, um, the council coordinates the region's legacy project selection process but it is the locally elected boards in each of these implementing agencies that select those projects. The projects, of course, must be aligned with the legacy plan and those four pillars that we discussed, but also need to be consistent and identified as part of one of the regional parks uh, um, master plans that the council approves. Um, we have several examples of projects and the types of work and activities that, that um, this fund supports, but in the interest of time, I really just want to share one tidbit with you that just over the last three years, 2020, 21, and 22, that we've been able to uh, acquire 375 acres of land as part of our uh, build out of the, of the system through legacy. So next I'll turn to Andrew. Um, Chair, uh, Ch Thank you, Ms. Bar Barajas, appreciate it, yes. Yeah, Chair and members, my name is Andrew Korsberg. I'm the Policy and Planning Supervisor with DNR Parks and Trails. DNR provides a huge system of outdoor recreation across Minnesota with 75 state parks, recreation areas, 1,500 miles of state trails, 43 state forest campgrounds, 1,700 public water access sites, 35 state water trails, and 360 fishing piers. In addition to providing these significant outdoor recreation opportunities, DNR also protects, restores, and maintains some of the state's most valuable natural and cultural resources. Visitors to state parks and trails include both overnight campers and day use visitors who come from all over the state as well as visiting tourists from all over the country. DNR's portion of the legacy funding is primarily focused on, parks, on state parks, recreation areas, and trails of statewide significance and is used to supplement existing funding sources. Legacy funding is often a game changer in addressing gaps or helping support high priority projects. Uh, DNR legacy funding is focused around 
the pillars um, of the 25-year legacy plan. Here are a couple brief examples of the types of projects in these pillars. DNR's primary work in the connecting people to the outdoors pillar is to reduce barriers, improve access, build skills, and welcome all Minnesotans to the outdoors. Key examples include our uh, new library pass program where people can check out a state park permit at their local library. Multicultural marketing through the, our new uh, Trailblazer newsletter, which was re-envisioned to increase diverse representation in outdoor recreation, to reach new audiences, and to better reflect the diversity of park and trail visitors. Then, of course, we have the ICANN programs, which have been a great success at connecting new people to the outdoors. Uh, the next pillar is taking care of what we have. Part of providing welcoming park and trail experiences uh, is to provide quality facilities, including renovated shower and restroom buildings that are up-to-date, family-friendly, and focus on accessibility. DNR uses legacy funds to advance climate-friendly buildings, such as using solar panels and energy efficiency. Legacy also supports taking care of our natural resources. The picture here is an example of a 700-acre prairie restoration at Glendalough State Park. Uh, Legacy allows DNR to do more of this work, well, which has a huge impact on critical habitat and, and threatened endangered species. Uh, a great example of creating opportunities, a pillar investment, is in the new uh, Shipwreck Creek Campground at Split Rock Lighthouse State Park, which opened last summer. Uh, in addition to being a super popular campground, which is basically at full capacity most of the time, this campground connects to the regional bike, uh, bike trail system in Lake County. This project really demonstrates how legacy funds can facilitate partnerships between the DNR, regional parks, and trails in order to provide a seamless system of outdoor recreation across the state. Uh, and this last slide uh, is just more, sort of more details about the proposed allocations uh, across the legacy pillars for the next biennium. As you can see from the pie chart, the red shows that about 60% of legacy fund support taking care of what we have, which is a crucial need in the aging state parks and trails system. Uh, the green and orange uh, show funding towards connecting people to the outdoors and creating new opportunities, which are also key elements that we learned from the public input during the creation of the 25-year legacy plan. Uh, with that, I think... I think I got cut off. Uh, and, go. and now we'll pass it to our partner with Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails, Renee Matson. Thank you, uh, and welcome to the committee. Um, we look forward to your testimony, Ms. Matson. Thank you, Mr. Well, Kostrick. given thank you, Chair and committee members. Given the time restraints, I think what I'd like to do is, Andrew, if you could flip ahead to this page that has our allocation recommendations, our grant recommendations for FY24, please. Yes, I have it up. But okay, my, sorry. I don't know if it's showing we on your may, screen or not. To, to it is the second to last slide in your handout. Show. Yes, so it's the second to last slide in the handout that you have. And what I would point out is okay. the commission this year was able to recommend 14 fully funded projects for legacy grants. You'll see them on that uh, page in your handout for a total of almost $11.4 million. And one thing I would like to say um, in the interest of time is that we fully vet all of these projects. There is not a project that is recommended to the legislature that has not been visited, discussed over the course of several months. Um, many questions asked, a lot of back and forth, and what you see before you is our recommendation after that process has taken place. Um, our commissioners, we have 13, two from each district of our six districts and one at large, are very involved in this process and generally are able to tour all of the applicants within their district. So um, knowing that you have a hard stop three minutes ago, I would oh. say that this is the pertinent information for you. You've all been delivered copies of our 2022 policy and planning report, and I'm certainly happy to answer any questions after. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Madsen. I don't know where that beeping is coming from. Uh, it's. It it's from Wilcher. Oh, okay, very good. I wanted to make sure it wasn't a phone. Um, well, thank you very much, all of the testifiers, and thank you very much for um, um, abbreviating your testimony such that we can try to meet these this hard stop that we've passed already. But um, with that, um, Senator Her, I would like to just open it up for any questions sure. or comments by members. Does are there any Senator Green? Do you have any? I have so many add? questions. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I'll probably have to save them for the floor. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Senator Green. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate it. And then, and again, you know, apology for the mix-up earlier. And I really appreciate our testifiers, especially uh, Jen Su Jen from Minnesota Arts Board, you know, and Parts and Trial with uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Goldsberg, um and Ms. Baraha and um, Renee Matson online, and also you know our one and only Senator Cohen, who gave us some history and background of of uh, the legacy and also the Environmental Trust Fund, and we'll keep his advice uh, close to heart. And so, uh, Madam, if I can ask for inclusion one more time with this uh, bill, and so we can move on to, you know, in this community. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Herr, and thank you again, testifiers. Um, Senate File 1682 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. And would you okay. like to again? Sure. Um, do we have any update? Uh, okay. Uh, and thank you, members, for um, spend uh, a two long days, you know, for this legacy marathon. You know, uh, it has been easy uh, f for me. But I, I don't know your own perspective, uh, but like uh, you will, will, if there's any uh, other other uh, smaller bill, we may try to find times for that uh, for legacy. But we will uh, we'll come up with omnibus. We'll put all this together in omnibus bill and bring forth to your review one more time before we send, send it uh, forward to either the finance or the um, uh, floor for the entire Senate uh, approval. So thank you for your patience for the last two days and thank you for mem member audience and testify for joining us too. And again, thank you, Senator Cohen. And now uh, committee is adjourned. <laughs>